All right, ready? Yes. Okay. I'd like to call to the special session. <coughs> oh, sorry. I'd like to call order the special session meeting of the Solvent City Council, Saturday, June 6th, 2020, 10 a.m. Can I get a roll call? Mayor Patron Clark? Here. Councilmember DeGernius? Here. Councilmember Waite? Here. Councilmember Johnson? Here. Mayor Tassant? Here. Uh, Robert, you want to lead us in the pledge? Yes. Please stand. Place your right hand over your heart. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's all. Okay, we'll start with the 2020-22 um, preliminary financial plan staff report. So today is um, another session regarding the preliminary um, budget for a two-year financial plan. I'd like to remind everybody about prior council actions uh, that led us to today and prior meetings that the council held in um, uh, serious to develop this financial plan. So on January 13, 2020, the council adopted the grant funding policy to where you um, changed the policy to focus on humanitarian services only and specifically to focus on senior services. Then on January 22, 2020, uh, during a regular meeting of the council, you uh, considered the financial plan development and pol gave policy direction to transition from a one-year plan to a two-year plan. With a two-year plan, you're really setting the priorities for two years, but then you will be still adopting budget each year. Um, and then in April 27, the council uh, saw the financial forecasts and provided with additional policy recommendations. And then finally on May 11, you overviewed very similar uh, information as you will be seeing today and gave initial policy direction specifically to many of the items in the capital improvement program. So today's focus is really, we have looked at the process, um, you gave policy direction on that, um, and it was a three-step process in the beginning to where um, we looked at the overall process of, of the financial plan. The next step was to look at the forecast, which is what she did. And then we said that we will be coming back with a preliminary plan, which is was May 11th, um, which was at the end of the agenda. And so the council scheduled an additional meeting today to provide with additional uh, opportunity for public to speak on these items for inclusion in the final budget development that will be presented to you on June 22nd. So today's focus is really to look at the budget allocations by program and whether that meets your policy direction and your goals for the next financial plan. So some of the things that as we present uh, from multiple people today would be for you to focus on whether or not the proposed allocations accomplish what you would like to see accomplished over the next two years. And the format of the presentation today is going to be a three-step presentation. Uh, we would first start actually with looking at the, some of the findings on CalPERS, which we have our consultants here, John, uh, John that the council approved uh, a contract to look at our pension obligations and to look at our plan. So they're here with us today on Zoom, and we'll start with their presentation. Uh, they've performed the analysis, and I think uh, this is very timely in the financial plan. It's, it's one of those uh, financial impacts that we have been talking about looking into, and that's a good start of the conversation mm -hmm. as we dive into additional concepts. Uh, after that presentation, we'll be looking at operating budget uh, by program and any allocations that are recommended for the next two years. And then finally, we'll end the presentation with uh, specific uh, allocations that we are proposing for special projects for the next two years, as well as for the capital improvement program. And then the capital improvement program will also outline projects for the next two years and kind of the strategic look of longer term capital improvement program. So with that, I would like to ask Jeremy as he comes back in the room to see if Joe, Joe and John, our consultants for CalPERS, 
are on the line. They should be on Zoom with us. So this is Joe. Can you hear me now? Sorry, I was just trying to set my background. <laughs> yes, we can hear you now. Okay, can you see me as well? I see, okay. Yeah, and would you like to share your screen for the presentation or otherwise we can... Um... Either one, I can, I'll let me go ahead and share mine. Okay, that'd be great. So, I do you too. have a screen? Same here. Can you guys see the screen? No. Oh, so far we can see you. Okay, hang on. Try this. We go back to Zoom. So, share screen. It says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Yeah, no, I was checking all you want. So it looks like it looks like you have, you're not permitting me to share my screen currently. Working on it. Okay. I can just use the one there if I can see it. That's fine too. So now you should be able to share. We change the setting. Try again, John. Okay. Yep. Uh, um, can you see this now? Yes. Yes. Is it a full screen as well? Yes. yes. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the chance to be here. Um, I think we can be relatively brief. We've got, I think, 13 or 14 slides. And I will start off by giving a little bit of an overview, and I'll go through some calipers details, then some city of Solvang details with <coughs> to members and funded status and so forth. And then John will take over and talk about uh, options from there. Um, so. The objectives of the report that we sent to you earlier this week uh, are really to, to get a baseline sense of where you are with respect to your relationship with CalPERS and the cost associated with that relationship in terms of providing uh, retiree benefits to uh, employees and retirees. And the second, again, is to talk about the uh, options that you might have. And again, John will focus on that today. So um, let me start with just saying that the, the, the background of this is that if you, if you think it's bad now, it will get worse. And that's not the message that I want to be able to deliver, but that's just the reality. And it, 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 it doesn't matter whether uh, you are the city of Solvang or the city of San Jose or the uh, you know, Madera City School District, uh, everyone is more or less in the same position in the state. There is not a single uh, public pension system or fund that I know of in the state of California that I would say is in good financial shape. Some are a little bit better off, some of the independents, but you as a CalPERS agency, a member agency, are about the same as everyone else out there. And I'll go into some of those details. Much of the reason for that is because of the way public pensions are governed. So as uh, I outlined in the report, there are certain guidelines that are provided for public and private pension systems. And, and, and when I talk about this, I'm going to be talking about ones that are uh, 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 defined benefits, so even on the private sector side. And there are a few companies with defined benefits. There are not really not many of them, but there are some out there. But there are big differences between the two, and those big differences in the, the rules that they operate under 
have led to a pretty dismal situation for the public uh, pensions across the country. Much of what happens in terms of public sector pension accounting and governance is about finding a way to push today's cost in the future. Uh, it, that's been the case for about 25 or 30 years now. Uh, and it's in, in public sector pensions can do this because ERISA, uh, the federal law that covers private sector pensions, does not apply to public sector pensions. So this sort of, you know, the story that I used to tell is, I mean, everyone is either seen or is, you know, knows um, Wimpy from the Popeye cartoon. Uh, and, you know, he, he would always say, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. You know, I will gladly find a way to spend money today and then hope that I could find a way to find the money to pay on Tuesday. So that's that's sort of, you know, that's that's not a, you know, governing principle, but that's the reality of how things work. And I'll give you just a few examples. And again, this applies to everyone. So number one, CalPERS has a high discount rate. Their discount rate is set equal to the investment rate of return. That rate has been high, as high as 8.75% in the past. It is now 7%. And to give CalPERS some credit, they've at least moved that in the right direction. They've moved down to about uh, again, seven percent. In my opinion, it ought to be at the highest, about five and a half, maybe a little less than that. And the difference between a discount rate of five and a half and seven percent is a big difference. And in fact, over time, it grows very quickly. You know, Einstein is always credited with saying, the "Compound interest is the most uh, powerful force in the universe." And so, over a very short time, you can get in really bad shape. So that's one thing they do that, that puts them in a hole. And, and the read is the reason that you and others are in a hole. Second is that public pension systems have long amortization periods. So let's say that you uh, operate uh, uh, this year, uh, and, and in fact, that's the case in this year, fiscal year 20, CalPERS is not going to earn their 7%. They will probably end up, they, their best guess recently was 0%. I think it's going to be a little better than that. I think they'll end up plus one or plus two. But if you're expecting seven and you end up at plus one or plus two, that means the effect, you know, you, you, you underperform for the year. And so you have to create an amortization tranche and you've got to find a way to pay that over the next 20 years. So they would actually say, okay, we, you know, we, we're, we're $5 billion under this year. Let's put that $5 billion into an amortization tranche and let's figure out a way to pay that over 20 years. The public sector uses 20 years. The private sector by law has to use seven years. And the effect of that 20 year period is that you don't recognize, it's like, it's like someone with a credit card, someone with a credit card debt and that credit card debt and you say, you know what, I'll pay it off over 20 or I'll pay it off over seven. Obviously if you pay it off over 20 years, you pay a lot more. Public sector pensions also have an amortization lag period. That means that they don't even begin to pay those amortization costs for two years. And then they actually, even with that, they slowly ramp up. They sort of say, well, let's, you know, let's pay zero in year one, and zero in year two, then year three, let's pay 20% then 40%. And they slowly ramp up to the full payment. So again, that has the effect of backloading those payments. That, that's the reason that even though, uh, you know, you had losses uh, and then some subsequent gains, you still have this long tail of obligations or liabilities that you have to uh, satisfy. Um, public pensions also use asset valuation quarters. They used to use something called uh, an actuarial value of assets. And they would say, well, you know, the market value is 100 billion, but we think the market's down. So we're going to say it's worth 120. Now, CalPERS doesn't do this anymore. They haven't done this for 20 years, but, but across different agencies that are public pension systems, they do that. The last thing, and this is really critical, there are no consequences to a poor funded ratio. And again, the funded ratio is simply assets divided by liabilities. And let's say that your funded ratio falls to 15%. 
which is roughly the funded ratio of the Chicago school teachers pension fund, there are no consequences. They don't have to freeze pensions. They don't have to make certain contributions. That is not the case on the public, on the private side. So the public sector essentially says, we're going to do what we want to do. Uh, there are no rules that govern us. So that's one of the reasons that, that you're in this position you're at. So this gives you a sense of the CalPERS funding ratio um, that shows uh, this since 1993. That's the earliest year I had data. And you actually see um, that the, um, uh, you know, they got up to what they were claiming was 140% funded uh, ratio. So, you know, $140 for every $100 that they owed in liabilities at the time. In reality, that was not accurate. It wasn't accurate because of these accounting gimmicks that I just described. It was probably somewhere around 80 or so, but it certainly was never 140. And of course, in 1999, right about here, is when the state legislature uh, first expanded benefits and went to things like 3%, 50 for safety, and so forth. And that added a number of liabilities to the system. So since then, we've had a couple of, quote, market corrections, you know, here, here, and then there's going to be another one here, not quite so large. But CalPERS today is about a 70% funded ratio. Solvang's miscellaneous plan is about the same. So you've got about 70 cents for every dollar that you owe uh, currently. What's distressing about this is if you compare this with the stock market performance, even with the um, you know, downturn in the market starting in February of this year, the stock market, the S&P 500, which is the broadest measure, has increased 10% per year on average since July of 2010. So think about that the S&P has increased by uh, about 200%, it's tripled, but despite that, this funded ratio has been right about 70% the entire time. Um, and that tells you there's something else besides, uh, it's not just about the market performing or open performing, there's something else going on that's causing these problems. Hey Joe, can I interrupt you for just okay. five seconds? What would that funded ratio be at the proper valuation of like 6%, a discount rate of 6%? You said it was around 70% at 7%. It, it's about 70, and if you were at 6%, I, had, I, I could calculate it, but I'm guessing that it would probably be around 58 to 60. Right, so the true number really is around 60 or less. And if you use the 5.5% that you suggest, it would be even worse, correct? Correct. And what, and what and, was, and, and, go ahead. I, yeah, and I will tell you real quickly, so all of my, you know, most of the people I work with think that I am too optimistic. If you talk to an average financial economist, uh, they will tell you, and there's plenty of theory for this and evidence for this, they would argue that because these obligations are, quote, guaranteed, because they are defined benefits, they are, as one, some, one of my economist friends at Stanford calls them, hell or high water commitments, then you should discount those liabilities at the 20-year treasury rate. Which is? Uh, well, today it's 1%. Right, so I just wanted you to say that publicly, which yes, means it's, it's much, much worse, right? Okay, right. and then what, one last question. What was the 10-year return on investment for CalPERS from 2000, roughly 2009 to 2019? Uh, I have a chart on that there, but, but, but the short answer is they're about 2% uh, below their target. I thought it was around 5 No, I don't think so. If, well, I'll, I'll look at the chart in a second, but I think it's about 2 you, You're asking for the, the total return or the underperformance? The total return. I was looking at your chart. Maybe I misunderstood. It's about five. It's about five, which yeah. is about two percent below the target. And I just wanted to compare that to the ten percent that the market has yes. averaged. So, yes. in other words, your chart is nice, but it's actually understating the real problem, right? Uh, yes. 
And so, and so the report, that's, I actually have that in the report, I can't remember which page it's on, but if you look at the report, it will actually, it, it has the, the, the treasury rate, the funding ratio based on the treasury rate, um, and it has additional information on performance as well. So here's, um, you know, I like to tell people that, you know, it's, it's, the problem is not assets, it's not liabilities, it's both. And I think this gets your question. Uh, and that was council member DeJernis, right? Yes, yes. I, yeah, okay, right. sure. I, I think I know your voice, but <laughs> so I'm not sure. So um, this shows the uh, CalPERS uh, uh, compound annual growth rate over various periods of time. And I've compared it with what their discount rate was or what they expected to earn over that time. So between uh, over the last three years, and this is, you know, this was to, I think I cut this up on May 1st or 15th, roughly the same. Um, their uh, annual average was 5%, and they were shooting for 7 so that's 2% lower. If you compare the last five years, 2015 to 2020, they were shooting for about 7-1. And the reason that's higher is because, again, their discount rate has been slowly lowered over time, but they've missed that by about two. If you look at the 10-year, they've actually done better uh, than their discount rate. And, and I'll get to that in a second. Then the 20-year, they're about 2.4% down. And in the 30 year, they're about two tenths of 1% down. So you look at this 20 year and you say, or 30 year, excuse me, from 1900 to 2020, you say, hey, that's not so bad. We must be in good shape. Well, they're not in good shape because one, this, this magic power of compound, you know, uh, compound interest, if you will, or compounding over time, is even a small under uh, performance will lead to a big change over time. And the other issue is, of course, that liabilities have increased. People always think, well, if we get 7%, we'll be okay. Well, no, because you've got left liabilities that you're expanding, so you've actually got to do a lot better than 7% to cover those liabilities. If you had flat liabilities, that would be one thing, but they don't. CalPERS liabilities have increased about 6% per year. So you might be running as fast as you can to get to that 7% uh, growth rate, that 7% investment rate return, but you've also got to consider that you've got someone chasing you and they're growing at a very rapid rate as well. So again, it's assets and liabilities that have gotten us here. The whole thing, uh, so I have this sort of city of sold thing, this is the unfunded liability, and this is for all, this is for all of your plans. It's about 98% miscellaneous. You know, there's a little bit of pepper miscellaneous, there's a tiny bit of safety, but the unfunded liabilities are up about 50% since 2009. You've gone from $3 million in unfunded liability to $4.5 million in 2015. And the report goes through different scenarios as to where that's going over the last several years. This shows something that you guys can probably relate to more uh, maybe it's more tangible, and that is your uh, contribution rates. And the contribution rates, as you see, and I've got those from 2008 to 2021, and 2021 are already set because they actually set those two years, two plus years in advance, you know, so your 2021 rates were actually set in 2000, uh, at the end of 2018. And your normal cost, which is the cost of, you know, that's the cost of, an ongoing cost of paying for uh, benefits in that year has gone from around 8% to around you know 13%. So even normal costs have increased fairly considerably. It looks a little, uh, maybe the chart isn't fair in the sense that you know you look at that red and it's still relatively low, but from eight to almost 13 uh, is you know, and more than a 50% increase. But where the real pain has been for you and for everyone is your unfunded contribution rate, what you were paying to, to amortize that loss. And so as you see, it's gone from a couple of percent per year in 2008 to today, uh, more than, uh, you know, uh, not quite 20%, I'll say. 
So, uh, you know, that has caused a real, and again, that you're, you're not alone, and it doesn't make you feel better. Uh, but overall, your contribution rate has gone from about 10% total to nearly 30% total in the year 2021. And you're probably saying, well, that's okay because we've had some good performance years and so forth. And so that unfunded rate's actually going to come down. That's, you'll see in a second that that's not the case. So here's the contribution rates. Um, if you start in the year 2020, your, your um, aggregate contribution rate, this is, there isn't any, in a, you know, essentially there, it's miscellaneous. And then there's, I guess I said, there's a little bit of pepper miscellaneous to safety. This number here in the year 2020 is, is exactly 21.5%. So you say, well, things will definitely get better, right? Because we've had these good, you know, or better than average years, or, or at least better performance, I should say, in the market. Well, actually, even if you have, even if you stay on that baseline case, and if that, the number here is, you go from 21 and a half in the year 2020, and it, even if you, that gold line in the, that's in the middle, that gold line is the baseline. That assumes that you uh, and CalPERS do exactly as planned. In other words, you get 7% per year, every year until the year 2030. And if you were actually to the year 2028, again, these are set a couple of years in advance. Um, so if you do exactly as planned, your contribution rates, uh, rate, excuse me, will continue to increase until about the year 2027, and then it will come down just slightly. So you end up at about 29% under the baseline scenario. If you get lucky, if you get lucky, and CalPERS gets lucky, and everyone in California gets lucky, and you have what I defined as a favorable scenario, and that favorable scenario is rather than earning 7% per year, in the years 2022, 23, 24, and those are all fiscal years ending on June 30th, each of those. Um, that if you get 10% instead of seven, then you're on the red line and you follow the same path up to 2025. Again, there's that lag in, in the, the, the impact of those rates because it takes you know, three years for things to, to kick in for the good or bad performance to kick in. Then that red line is more or less the same as the uh, gold line until 2027, and then it comes down, and so you end up at about 26%. So if you have 7% rates of return every year, except for 2022, 23, 24, and you get 10, you end up at about 26% in the year 2030. And again, you, today you're at 21 and a half. If on the other hand, the system underperforms and an underperform, uh, underperformance in my definition of my model is that you earn only 4% in those same years. So in 2022, 23, and 24, instead of 10%, you earn 4%. If that happens, then you end up on the right hand side on the green line at about a 34% contribution rate. So you know, you can sort of decide what you think a more likely scenario is. If you look historically, the more likely scenario is the green line. If you look to see what people are forecasting for equity markets, you're more than likely to be on that green line. Uh, you know, it is, it is very unlikely uh, that CalPERS is going to earn 7% per year on average every year. It is more likely that they will underperform and you'll end up on the green line or closer to the green line than anything else here. Uh, and again, those just uh, show the rates of return 10 versus 4 instead of 7 for the three years that I picked. And, and we can, you know, I can pretty easily change those assumptions if that's something you guys are interested in. Well, actually, I am interested in, in seeing it at the three, was that the three and the five year rate, which is real, roughly 5%. I mean, if I were, financial advisors would be wrong to suggest that they would do better than that, right? Because the, the market environment today is very different than it was five, 10, 20 years ago when they were making superior returns. Yeah. 
I think this 4% rate of return for three years ends up averaging to about five, maybe a little under five, something like that. But I can I can do the math on that let you know. But it's but it's it's roughly, I think when I did this, I was sort of aiming for a five percent target. And I think that four percent gets you there. The three years of underperforming gets you gets you exactly there. Um, and so that, that sort of gives you a sense of, you know, wh where you've been, uh, where you are today, where you're likely to be based on these different scenarios over time. And again, I want to emphasize the, the, the gold line here, the baseline. The, you know, that, that is if things go perfectly according to plan. And the question is, have things gone perfectly according to plan over the last 20 years for CalPERS or any public pension and the answer is no. So that's an unlikely outcome in my opinion. And I think most people agree with that. So with that, I will turn it over to, to uh, John and he can uh, walk through some of the options. Hi, uh, good morning. Hang on one sec, let me just get my face back. Here, there we go, all right. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Joe, can you just advance the slide uh, to the, the next to the? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, go. Back. I'm sorry. Go back. Uh, there you go. All right. So, um, so we looked based on Joe's analysis and also based on um, factoring in a little bit what we know you're facing uh, uh, in terms of uh, the, the uh, revenue loss as a result of COVID, uh, and uh, you know to consider what your options might be, because to some extent, obviously, the COVID revenue loss kind of compounds this problem, uh, although you don't know how long that loss is going to go on for. But uh, uh, so the first thing we looked at uh, was uh, the possibility, of course, of exiting uh, CalPERS. And I think Joe and I agree uh, that, uh, that that is probably not a viable option uh, for you. Um, and by the way, uh, so this estimated liability at, uh, uh, at uh, $42.8 million, uh, it actually understates what you would end up paying. I'm handling a termination right now. Uh, and uh, CalPERS bases its termination rate, uh, its termination pool on uh, uh, basically a lower discount rate of, uh, which is comprised of a, essentially a blend of uh, the 10 and 30 year treasuries, uh, which uh, for simple math purposes, you could just view as the 20 year treasury, although it's not, it's not exactly right, but it's close enough for government work. And, uh, and that's going to get you <laughs> as, uh, uh, as Joe says, uh, that's going to get you about 1.2% right now. Uh, uh, now that's unusual, uh, but uh, importantly, uh, the, the, the 20 year treasury uh, a year and a half ago was at 3%, uh, and, uh, and then it dropped to two uh, as of January 1 of this year. And now as I say, it's it, because of the COVID Thing. It's, it's, it's closer to one. So, and, and Daryl, uh, numbers... Daryl, what happens if the twenty-year bond goes negative? Yeah, I think it was a question for Joe, right? So, you know, I don't, I don't think that's anything that Calpers has anticipated. I, I will say, Jonathan kind of alluded to this: the Calpers contribution for the termination rate is a little bit of a black box. Um, it, it is, it approximates the 20 year treasury, but it's not exactly the 20 year treasury. And, um, I, I don't know, I, I, I've never, I've never heard or seen any discussion from CalPERS on that. It's a, it's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, but, um, well, just to be clear, what's the probability that we might see negative interest rates in the next year, given the way the futures market's trading? I think the Higher future. Than yesterday. Um, <laughs> well, yesterday I think was kind of an interesting event. I agree, but the futures markets yeah, were pricing in a negative rate a year from now. Right. Right. No, understand. Understand. I mean, I, I think it's you know it, it is. I will just say it's more than a negligible probability that that's correct that that would occur. 
I do. I do. I don't know how CalPERS would deal with that. I assume. I mean, I. I don't know how they would deal with that. I mean, so it would. It would. Was that based on the twenty, and, and they, I would think they would stay relatively close to the twenty-year uh, rate. So if it That's just fine. in general, if we did go in that direction, negative rates, it would make the termination liability even larger, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah, but, and, and, but and so I mean. <laughs> Uh, just a minor anecdote, uh, I'm handling this termination right now, and um, the really scary part about the way CalPERS does terminations is they give you an estimate uh, when you give them their, your first notice that you're going to terminate, but then there's a one-year lag before, between that and when you actually terminate, and, uh, and then they give you a final actuarial, and so in this particular case, um, the, uh, the difference between the estimated termination liability uh, and, and what turned out to be the termination liability was very close to 50%. So, uh, so, you know, one of the really scary parts about the termination, totally aside from the sheer insane number you'd be looking at, is, is you wouldn't know what your number is uh, going into it. Uh, and uh, so there's a tremendous risk uh, and again, it's really hypothetical because even 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 forty eight forty two point eight million is not you know is not a viable number I think for anybody. So uh, given given how much higher that is than your unfunded liability at you know you know five let's say five percent or six percent or uh, certainly at seven current discount rate. So um, John, can I just add one other comment? And that is that in the report, I I, I did termination liabilities at one percent, which is the rate today, or was when I wrote this. And then I looked at uh, uh, went ahead and went to two uh, two and a half percent in the future. And I think the highest number, I think you got up to about sixty something million dollars, depending on the scenario. So I think a reason, you know, the reasonable <laughs> range of scenarios puts you at the sixty million dollar range. Wow, that's just exciting. <laughs> yeah, sorry. yeah. I, I, I think the bottom line is, at least currently, it's a non-starter. Uh, you know, uh, I guess the interesting thing is, if at some point uh, way down the road, uh, you know, the Treasury uh, T bills, you know, go way up, <laughs> it could be something that might be viable. But uh, uh, and and by the way, there, I think Calpers is is in the middle of some reconsideration of uh, how they price termination liability. Uh, I, I don't think they're very far along on that discussion, but, um, uh, but you know, the reality of, of the situation we believe is that CalPERS is in fact um, uh, not reinvesting the money at, in 20 year T-bills, but in other investments that are pretty solid that probably do considerably better than a, than a zero risk so, um, so in any event, that you know, right now, that's just not really a viable option. I think termination for for you know just about anybody. Um, the um, and, and and the unfortunate part about it is, is, and I think you guys, being kind of sophisticated consumers of this, realize that. So that puts you in this position where even if you paid off your unfunded liability at the regular rate, you know, at whatever rate that turns out to be. Um, that you know you would not be protected uh, against new unfunded liability with respect to people who are, who are in the system, and and so uh, one. I mean, the one really great thing about termination in Calpers is when you're done, you're done. If the markets crash, if the markets whatever doesn't matter, uh, you're you're done. Uh, they they assume the downside risk, although again at a one percent rate, that's not much of a risk. But um, but um, you know so that so then you're stuck with what I would say is sort of this this world of there's no silver bullet uh, for how to how to deal with this issue. And so we we um, you know spent some time really thinking about uh, and and we've also talked to, to a couple of people folks sort of independently a little bit about, you know, what are um, the, uh, the things that you can do. So one of the things uh, that I did not mention in earlier conversations uh, and in our earlier meeting is um, that we, uh, you know, that you could, 
your contracts are about, I think you have one year to go on your, your labor contracts right now. So your labor contract, I should say. Uh, and uh, you could uh, increase the employee contributions. The, there's an oddity in the way that you, uh, your labor contracts uh, work because you have what, what we in the trade refer to as a swap, which is to say that, that you are paying 100% of the employee contribution and employees are paying what, is, what amounts to an equivalent amount of the employer contribution. Uh, that that's very beneficial to employees because it results in a, a, a higher uh, um, uh, final compensation, uh, and but it's also in the long run um, expensive because uh, because you're 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 essentially goosing uh, final compensation. Um, so um, one recommendation um, is that at some point you consider undoing the swap uh, and having employees pay the employee contribution, employer pay the employer contribution, and then cost share the employer contribution beyond the, the 8% that the employees are paying in. And right now, again, it's an 8%. Uh, it would not be unreasonable to ask employees to pay 10% uh, uh, for a miscellaneous plan. Uh, and that's where a lot of folks, a lot of other uh, cities are, are, are going right now. Now, bear in mind that only affects classic employees uh, because your, uh, your PEPRA employees are already paying 50% of the normal cost of the PEPRA plan. Uh, that doesn't mean you couldn't ask them for more, but quite honestly, it, 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 the plan is, is inferior in, in significant ways uh, from uh, the classic plans. So from an equity perspective, asking them to pay more uh, you know, is is a little harder because because the plan is, is a weaker plan. So so th there's not a lot of money in that issue, but uh, but there is some money uh, in that issue. Um, another thing to consider, and and I, I realize my timing on this is is not good given the COVID crisis. So this is something that you want to consider. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, going out probably is. Um, some form of either accelerating the amortization or um, putting more funding into a 115 plan. I know you have a 115 plan. Uh, I think it's I think it's for the OPEP liability. Uh, uh, but um, uh, so the the issue here is um, you know in, in very simple terms, uh, some of your amortization uh, uh, tiers. Uh, go out 25-ish years. Some some don't, but but, but some do. And uh, you know, anytime you get into sort of plus 20 years, you're you're into negative amortization. Uh, so that's really costing you money. You're, uh, and besides the obvious point that you're you're paying, uh, you know, you, you're paying more the longer you amortize anything. Just sort of on the theory that that a longer mortgage costs you more. Uh, so, um, so there are a couple of ways of approaching this. Uh, uh, CalPERS does allow you to um, uh, to essentially prepay or uh, overpay, for lack of a better word, um, uh, uh, into their plan. The downside of giving the money to CalPERS is obviously number one <laughs> that they're investing it, uh, and if you don't trust their investment strategies, uh, this only makes it worse because CalPERS can take that money and lose it. Uh, the, um, uh, the other downside of it is that when you pay into CalPERS to pay down unfunded liability, uh, it's a one-way street. Uh, the money goes in. Uh, there's no way for you to pull the money back out uh, if you needed it, if you were desperate in some way or another. Uh, the advantage of a 115 plan uh, is, as you know, that uh, you can take the money uh, that you've put in the 115 plan, and if, if, if everything goes to hell in a handbasket, you you can actually use that money to simply pay your regular CalPERS contribution. Uh, the downside of uh, uh, of doing it, of uh, doing a 115 plan, is it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't reduce uh, what you're paying into CalPERS uh, for the amortized unfunded 
liability. Of course, you're generating money on the money that you've put aside to help pay that, but it doesn't reduce what CalPERS is charging you. So uh, that's something I, I think you know you guys uh, probably should look at as part of your long range planning. It's obviously not. This is probably, you know appears clearly not to be the year where you would do that. Uh, but you know, you're if you look at the numbers uh, and how basically you're you're going to get to pretty large numbers anyway um, uh, in terms of what Joe pointed out, in terms of the, 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 the cost of paying in for the unfunded liability is gonna rise quite a lot. Getting ahead of that curve uh, would be a really smart thing to do, although again, <laughs> uh, possibly not until obviously you've got a little bit more cash. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I know that you've had, you know, basically you've laid off about 50% of your, your, your staff. And so uh, this again may, may be a little bit mistimed, uh, uh, but, but maybe in some respects, because you've laid off half your staff, it's, it's a good time to be considering um, uh, more out of the box strategies to uh, reduce your headcount. And um, uh, I know, again, that the, the council has talked about this before. Um, one, there are a variety of uh, strategies uh, here. Um, one is um, to uh, either create or increase reliance on uh, joint powers authorities, which are effectively more efficient if they're structured right because you you, you, know, you don't need uh, as many people at the top. So uh, that can be uh, you know, a, a, good, a good strategy. Obviously, there are other strategies such as you know, contracting out that I'm, I know you guys have been considering as well. Um, uh, you know, keeping your headcount down obviously doesn't do anything for your past unfunded liability, but if you look at Joe's numbers and you really think about this, um, you are going to be developing new unfunded liability, not you know, not just uh, not just increasing the cost of your existing unfunded liability that you've accrued, but you're actually in every day going. If you assume Calpers is wrong on its on on its discount rate, uh, then every day you create new unfunded liability. Uh, so, um, so I, I, I think, you know, it's the old story of, of, uh, you know, uh, when you find yourself in a hole, first thing to do is stop digging. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and this is probably, uh, uh, you know, a valuable strategy. I, I've talked to, uh, Zdenia, you know, uh, somewhat about this. And I know that one of the challenges here is really that, uh, you don't have a whole lot right now uh, left. Uh, so I'm not sure this is a strategy for, for this particular uh, moment, but, uh, but I, I think it's, it's a good long-term strategy. I, I do see other cities talking about um, creating, I, I call them mega JPAs. Uh, I say talking about it because uh, it's not happening uh, quickly. There's so many challenges to, to the governance of JPAs. And you do have to be careful about that because uh, you know, one of the problems with JPAs is obviously that, that if, you, if you don't have enough control over their labor relations and what they're paying and what they're doing, uh, you, you know, you, you will achieve efficiencies because you'll have a, large, a smaller management tier, basically, but you will, <laughs> but you might do it at the cost of, of, of not having as much control over, over, over salaries and other things that, uh, and, and, you know, you're just getting a bill from the JPA. Uh, so, uh, Joe, you want to turn to the uh, next slide? Thank you. So, um, these uh, are uh, long-term options, depending on the circumstances. And I want to really stress, uh, we have now had a chance to really look at where you are, and I, 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 I strongly want to state that you're not, well, you're certainly not at the bankruptcy Point. The fiscal emergency point is a little bit different. You, you may or may not be at a fiscal emergency point because of the COVID problem, uh, uh, but the uh, the pension problem is, is you know fiscal emergency. Any emergency is is you know sudden, unexpected. That's basically the standard fiscal emergency is 
you know, that it should be something that's sort of sudden and unexpected. Uh, the CalPERS stuff is not your sudden and unexpected problem. Your sudden and unexpected problem is a dramatic loss in revenue. Uh, and uh, so, you, you, you know, arguably, uh, and again, I, I don't know enough you, about, I know that you have, you know, significant reserves. Uh, they're being spent down. I don't know how quickly they're being spent down. Um, and uh, well, I have looked at the long-term uh, forecast, et cetera. Uh, the, uh, you know, fiscal emergencies are subject to, uh, well, it, it, there is nothing wrong with declaring a fiscal emergency when you have a situation like you have. Um, the question isn't really whether you can declare it. The question is what can you do with it? And the standard for using fiscal emergency um, to, uh, to impair existing contracts, uh, which would be, say, labor contracts uh, or a CalPERS contract or whatever, is, uh, is a very, very challenging legal standard. Uh, and uh, the, you know, very few, there are cases uh, there are cases that come out of 08, 09, uh, where uh, folks use fiscal emergency. I've used fiscal emergency in, uh, I used it in Stockton uh, and in Fresno, and we almost did in San Jose. And there are, you know, things that you can do with fiscal emergency. But the other part of the challenge with the fiscal emergency is it is better suited to um, actions that you can take that are very directly related to the sort of problem that you've got and are narrowly tailored around the problem that you've got, which makes it not a great tool for, you know, very broad based changes. So let me give you an example of fiscal emergency that worked. Um, in Stockton, we uh, declared a fiscal emergency prior to uh, bankruptcy uh, and we uh, prevented employees from uh, cashing out their sick leave, which was something they were able to do under their MOUs. Uh, and the reason we did that is because uh, we were aware that in Vallejo, uh, that one of the things that ultimately caused Vallejo to, to run out of cash, uh, wasn't the underlying problem, but what caused Vallejo to run out of cash, was that when things started to go to heck, employees started getting worried and they had essentially run on the bank. They cashed out all their sick leave, and that was the actual precipitate that caused Vallejo to go under, although it was not the underlying problem. So in Stockton, we prevented that from happening, uh, and in doing so, we're able to buy ourselves six months. Uh, uh, so uh, to you know, so that was that's the value. The other problem with fiscal emergency is, in general, it is best suited to temporary actions. Uh, there, there's case law that suggests that's not always the case, but, but generally fiscal emergencies um, are best suited to temporary actions. Yeah. And then the final point, which, you know, I won't belabor because you're not there, uh, but, you know, it is important to recognize, and I just want to, because this relates directly to the CalPERS situation, uh, you know, uh, uh, point out, and we point out in our report, uh, that uh, you can adjust your uh, liabilities uh, in, in bankruptcy. Uh, uh, it did not happen in Stockton, but it could have. Uh, the judge made clear that it could have. Uh, the judge in the Detroit bankruptcy, uh, they did actually slightly impair uh, 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 pension liabilities. Uh, when you do that, to be clear, it flows directly through to your retired employees and, and ultimately your active employees as well in terms of what their future uh, pensions will uh, the um, so uh, that is something uh, that you can do. Uh, you're not there by any means. Um, I, I, I am a great believer in not really even using the B word uh, uh, unless you're you know really in serious consideration of it uh, uh, because um, it, it, it creates a cascade of, of bad things that happen with creditors and other things, even the discussion of it. So, uh, so uh, it's obviously not something to be thrown a lot around uh, lightly. Uh, but I do raise it just by way of you knowing what the, what the, what the, what the path ahead could look like if, if you know, everything goes to hell. So uh, uh, that's, uh, those are my remarks. Uh, Joe, anything you wanted to add to, uh, uh, to that? 
Uh, the, the only thing is, so back on this uh, termination rate issue, I, I'll create a, a chart that, that shows your termination cost based on different rates. Um, you know, as Council Jarvis was pointing out, you know, maybe, you know, it's, it's different, obviously, if two and a half versus one versus five. And so that will give everyone a better sense of when it might be worthwhile. Now, this all depends on CalPERS setting the rules or keeping this, this current rule, which is on, you know, it, it may be unlikely, uh, but at least it gives you a, a sense of the impact of that lower termination rate on the exit cost, but I'll get that to you. And that's it. Nothing else for me. Thank you. Um, I, as a courtesy, I want, we have some uh, members of the public that would like to give some public comment now because they have other um, things they need to get to. So okay. I'd like to just allow that, um, and then we can come back with any with any questions. questions. Okay. So first speaker, please. Yeah, I'm just going to take some public comment now to let the people that need to go, um, you know. Yeah. But but yeah, if we could we could. Um, uh, we'll come back with any questions the council has of Joe Nation. Yeah, after. Joe and Joe and John, if you could please hang out while we take yeah. public comment, and we'll have questions and discussion. Do you want me to keep the the, the same slides up, or do you want me to stop sharing? Uh, you can stop sharing for now. I guess we'll bring it back if we need to. Okay. okay for first speaker, please. Good morning. Okay. Um, Good morning. Actually, Sorry. first speaker is here. Um, yeah, I'm going to do um, first. I'm going to do uh, physical speakers here first, and then we'll and then I'll take a few on on Zoom if you wish to give your comments now. So we'll start with Ellen here. So you all know me as Ellen Albertoni, the director of the Solving okay. Senior Center. How's that? Is that better? Very good. Thank you so much for allowing me to spend just a few minutes with you today in person. It's so much nicer than Zoom, um, other than my glasses are fogged up. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you once again for all of the support you've uh, paid to the Senior Center over several years. Um, and we've been in discussion about support for the upcoming year, the upcoming budget. We're all rebudgeting, looking at our figures and so forth. but. I really hope that this year you will consider the amount that we've requested. Um, and it's not just a COVID-19 request because as we move forward out of COVID-19, that support will be very important as we continue to increase the number of members we have at the center, the number of activities, everything that we provide for them. Um, as I said, we, we are not being over gratuitous in our thanks, um, but these are members of your community that are very, very important. And we look forward as we plan our budget to know where we stand with our, um, with our city council because these are your members too. So thank you very much for your support and I will move on. So um, really quick, Ellen, while you're here, I just had a question for you. Um, yeah. I know you guys do uh, some fundraising throughout the year, and yes. I was just curious with all the, uh, with the current situation we're in now, how is it affecting your ability to raise um, funds? It, well, we were planning um, a large fundraiser this year. Of course, everybody's had to move their fundraisers into the fall or just discontinue them. So we basically put that on hold indefinitely. We have little fundraisers small fundraisers every month, which is our dinner night. And that's ended up, that's probably about $10,000 a year that we've been, we've, we're not able to hold those at this time. We cannot have people coming into the center for dinners. And what we're doing right now is um, people have to pre-order for hot meals. They come in in a designated time to pick their meals up. We're not or open for activities. Um, and if there's things that people need, they call us in advance and we, we can take care of them in that way for masks, for you know, acti games, activities, and so forth. We still receive fresh produce <coughs> from Veggie Rescue. We call people to let them know it's in. We enhance meals, we deliver meals. Um, but as far as our funding con is concerned, 
We've no longer been able to have the dinner nights. Um, we've had to discontinue our plans for our fundraiser. You know, we like to be able to take care of our, you know, you have to take care of yourself too, but some of our funders, major funders have cut back on funding us also. So we're, you know, we're kind of in limbo with some things. We run a very tight ship. We only have one full-time employee, which is me, and two part-time employees, which are in the kitchen. The rest is all, um, we have um, our folks who come out, our volunteers who help us. But at this point, we're not allowing some of our volunteers in because they're in the susceptible group of folks, so. Thank you. Does that help? Yeah, you? I just want the council to understand the dynamics that you know, you different organizations will I, go through. Do you have a question? Yeah, I just I do. I just want to uh, point out I didn't didn't hear you mention this, but I I know that the uh, Solving Senior Center is very active in assisting the seniors in our community prepare their taxes. How has that been affected? Because that that is an the, integral yes, service we, that we you offer. We closed our doors. Thank you for bringing that up because I usually remind you of that. Um, I've been standing out in the sun. Uh, <laughs> we, we closed our doors on that um, because AARP requested, obviously, that we do, which was March 16th was the last day. And we generally help three to 400 people a year with free income tax service. Um, and Mr. Clark, you were there in the middle of that wonderful chaos. <laughs> so um, it's a it's wonderful- It's pretty heartwarming. Yes. And you got, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful um, service that we provide, and AARP it was was considering starting up again, but we've decided that we don't want to expose um, our tax pre preparers because they're all over 70 and have some um, issues, and we don't want to expose our seniors um, as we try to figure out how we're going to open up the center, you know, moving forward. When can we allow them back in for activities and so forth. So that those are some other services we provide are um, we help people find medical services that we need. They need. We have a lending closet, which is open to the entire valley. And the VNA even calls on us often for uh, medical you know, wheelchairs and so forth. Um, <laughs> we've become a during the summer, we're often we have uh, members of the, we have visitors who come by looking for help. We can point them in every direction. So, uh, but our main concern obviously is our seniors and um, providing them what they need in our community. Thank you. Thank you. I have an idea. I'll talk to you later the, next week. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Next speaker. Do, do we have speakers? Second speaker. Good morning, I'm Andreas Piper, Solvang Residence. Um, first of all, I'm here to come and say thank you very much to the City Council for hearing and listening to your citizens and arranging on the 27th, I think, of June, our big meeting out at the, um, um, at the Vets Hall. We appreciate you listening. There's a big trust deficit between your citizens and the Council. And I hope that the 27th of June is where we start rebuilding that trust we we i heard some of you say last time that we don't understand what you're trying to do yes you're right because you have not been clear and transparent with us so please be clear and transparent with us we are here to listen to you but i want you really to listen to us <coughs> and understand that we want to have our voices heard on whatever growth we want in the city of Solvay. And let's start rebuilding that type of trust deficit. That was the real reason I wanted to come here this morning and thank you for that. And let's see if we can get that going. And then secondly, I understand the pension fund deficit is a big problem. I worked for the County of Santa Barbara. I was the benefits manager for almost 17 years, managed almost a $50 million budget. Very aware of how these things work. And um, we spent about an hour discussing something which we have very, very little that we can do about. So just think about the time. Um, I encourage you strongly when you sit down and negotiate with your unions to, to 
make them partners in this solution because they can be very powerful partners in this solution um, and not try and put everything on the employees. Let's try and find a, not a one-way solution but have a two-way solution to try and resolve this. And um, look forward to the 27th of June and hopefully that everybody's going to come here and listen to what your, your citizens and your voters have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Hey, good afternoon, Hank Homburg, Selving. Um, with regard to the CalPERS issue, CalPERS goes up and down. Obviously, with the account, with the whatever the the economy is doing in good times, it does really good. Obviously, in bad times, it's not going to do as well and produce. But to take CalPERS away from people who dedicate their lives 30 plus years to working for one organization is a disservice. Um, I think it's almost criminal because nowadays people get jobs every five years, they move around, they move around, they move around, and nobody has any specific knowledge about what the job it really is and how good they are with the job that they do. With public employees, people like to ridicule it, but the bottom line is you have people who know the job more than 30 or 20 plus years going into 30 plus years. They've invested into the position, they've invested into the job, and they've also put money into their pension. And um, to have a pandemic uh, as an opportunity to destroy that is, to me, criminal. And people like Mr. Holtzman, who's a lawyer, are the cause of that pandemic. Um, I don't know if he's listening or not, but that's a pandemic within CalPERS that is like uh, worse than COVID. So I urge you to talk to your employees, talk to your employee unions, um, work with them. And there's more than just a bottom line here. And you guys are responsible for a lot of people that have worked for the city, that are going to work for the city, and that are currently working for the city. And if you guys do something to mess that up, that could be devastating to a lot of people. These CalPERS people are the people that are buying cars, houses, uh, big items at Home Depot and, and, and Builders Emporium. They're not the hourly wage people that are coming in from out of the area making $12, $14 an hour uh, doing work that is manual labor. These are people that actually know what they're doing and have been doing it for years and years, and they're dedicated employees. So I urge you to, to really think twice about this whole CalPERS destruction that you, you're talking about. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Hey, Hank. How do you remember a builder's emporium? I'm old. That's right. I was thinking of Lowe's and Home Depot. Sorry. <laughs> but where were you? Where did you ever see a builder's emporium? I grew up in Torrance. Okay. So Eric Montrose as well. Got yeah, it. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. I'm showing my age. Me too. Thank you. <laughs> Next. Next speaker. Yeah. Do you want to switch to a Zoom? That's in, is there anybody else in person? Okay. Oh, okay. Do you want to mix in a Zoom? I'm trying. Some people want to get out here physically and they have to stay out in the sun. So. Oh, yeah, got it. Hi. Um, I have a question. Is, since this is about budgeting. Yes. About salary. So I, I may be your name. Oh, I'm sorry. My name's Joanne Clark, and I'm a solving resident. Um, the other day, the city attorney was seen directing the light hanging in solving. This is my question. Was he on the clock when that was going on? No. He, he was not. Okay, my concern is that, and this is what I I've, I've understand, and if I'm incorrect, then we need, it needs to be corrected, but his salary equates to about $350 an hour, and that he has accrued something like $800,000 this year. That's not correct. But does he require to itemize the things that he does? Because this is a, a problem then, because the community does not know this. And so it would be advisable, I think, to get that information to the community so we know exactly what someone's being paid and how, how that is taken care of. Because there's a lot of people with a lot of questions about why this gentleman's earning the money that he's earning when the previous one earned so much less. And so you've got a lot of citizens that are really upset about this. And uh, I think it would be in your best interest to try and get that information out to everybody. Thank you. 
I'm sorry, but Chip, would you mind taking the opportunity to please respond to that? And then also, just so you know, we are working on an explanation of attorney fees and things like that that we'll, that we'll come out with. That would be so. really, really, really great. Mr. Mayor, on the light hanging issue, I happen to be driving from my home here to a meeting here at City Hall that was scheduled. I do not, actually, unlike the former city attorney who would bill for his driving time from Atascadero, I do not charge for my travel time because I knew that there was activity going on in Copenhagen and I'm actually kind of a, you know, I'm interested in what goes on in the community. I drove down Copenhagen, I stopped, I walked over and talked briefly to the people who were putting up the lights. I did not charge for that, I was not billing. I also happened to see the former mayor and the former county sheriff who were sitting talking on a bench. I spoke with them because I have known them for many years. They asked me, I thought, what was going on on the street and I told them about it. I think I now realize they asked me why I was in town and that seems to have been the source of that particular set of that rumor. No, that's not. No, well, that those wasn't were the what only, I heard. Those were the only people yeah. I spoke with, and so there was. Those were the only people I spoke with, and I did not, and do not charge for many, many, many things that I do because I happen to live in this community. For example, I had breakfast on Copenhagen this morning. I helped actually carry one of the shade structures and some tables and chairs over in front of the only restaurant that was open because I live in, like, appreciate, and try and help in this community. I am not billing actually for anything I'm doing today because during this time period of COVID and all these other emergencies, I have agreed with the city to significantly cap my fees in April, May, and June. I am spending more time on this client than I think I've ever spent on any client because the city has great need. I am a partner in a law firm of approximately 26, I think we have, attorneys. We also have staff including secretaries, paralegals, and others. My billing rate for the city is $330 an hour. That includes all of those people who back me up, which means that the city doesn't have to have secretaries, paralegals, and other things. That's a business function that you guys contract out for. So I am not taking home that dollar amount. I believe that my total billing this year to Solvang is, I think it is somewhere in the neighborhood of 425-ish dollars I'm sorry, 425,000, not 800 and something that is being sp spread around. I do provide monthly detailed bills to the city. And I would just note this city, not just from the city attorney in the past, but your planning department, a number of other departments, you guys have not actually been having work a lot of work has not been done. And so the difference between the former city attorney who was essentially reviewing things a couple of times a month when he would come to meetings that were prepared primarily by the city clerk and what I've been doing, it involves quite a bit, substantially, more work. There has been substantial <coughs> change that has occurred in this city since a year ago substantial and that has in involved substantial work. It has included the fact that you all were being threatened with a lawsuit by, um, by a group who was trying to get a cannabis sales license. They were threatening millions of dollars of lawsuit. You went through a significant process because the council decided to change the direction on the way that tourism promotion was occurring and the tourism group that the city had been paying approximately a million dollars a year 
did not want to change that direction. So there was significant cost involved in that. Um, I could go down through a, a long list of those things where there is significant cost. I would note right now in particular, given that the, the city is in the midst of first COVID and then COVID caused economic emergency, the city is down at least a third of its staff. And so there are two or three department heads now that I am helping and a small group of city staff doing the work that was being done by a significantly larger number of people. And so there is more work and during that time, again, I am capping my, my charges to the city to about 25% of what I would be charging my private clients. And right back to, please, note, I am not charging you all for helping move things when I happen to be downtown because I live here in the city and appreciate the city. I went to the, there was a vigil last night um, that I attended. I did not charge you all for that. I did not charge for the meetings with the sheriff's office prior to that because they were concerned about what was going to happen or could happen in downtown and that had been spread as rumors on social media. And there is a lot of rumor spreading on social media occurring right now. I'm not, not saying that's where you're getting your information, but I, I, but I am finding that there is a lot of misinformation being spread on social media. And so I, I hope, Mr. Mayor, that provides some explanation and I'm happy to provide more yeah. if you'd like. I just also want to iterate that it's not, it's not like this is a permanent thing. You know, the, the attorney fees will go down. You know, we are making changes. Those changes in the long term will affect the bottom line of the expenses the city incurs once a year. So that will actually should show a return on investment. Um, and again, I'd also like to point out that, you know, Chip is very active in our local community. He's not charging if you see him out there. He just happens to live here. He is active. Um, one of the recent things this council just did was fund, um, a, you know, quite a bit of money towards um, feeding people um, here in the, as, we, as a result of the food lines we were seeing and things like that. Um, I, I was out there on the days it was happening. I know Chip was out there a full day moving boxes, you know, doing heavy lifting, whatever, whatever it took to help out as a volunteer amongst volunteers and did not charge the city for it. So I, I know he does do a lot of things that's active in the community. I just think it's unfortunate when people then label it as he must be charging the city to do that. We, we would in no way be, be funding that kind of activity. Well, that's good to know and good to hear. And uh, while you were saying this, the fact that you know that there's rumor and there's obviously a disconnect then I would um, suggest that you do everything possible to get that corrected by putting, I don't know if you have a Facebook page or if you have a, where you could actually show what you just said is true and people can see those facts. That would be very helpful because uh, rumor does get started and the things you said are, I find very interesting. But if you can put that forward for the community, openness so the community can see those things it would be in your best interest and our best interest and something else that you said i would be interested in this council looking into the costs of your firm and the people that work with you compared to the costs before when other people were doing those jobs compare those two costs which are costing the city more and i i think that that would be just wise yeah Thank you. Which is what at, I was just saying. There, yeah, there is, there should see. be an ROI. It's not a permanent thing. You know, there has changed. There have been events that have happened, um, but again, that that is not a um, a permanent thing at all. And right now, when there is a lot of a lot of um, concern in the community, it would really be advisable, like I said, to please get those things corrected. If you that you have just told me that a lot of people are not going to hear, not going to see. Put it somewhere where but they can. They'll watch Facebook and believe whatever they see on okay. Facebook. Well, I don't follow this on <laughs> Facebook. Let her finish. Yeah. I don't follow this on Facebook. I talk to really reasonable, good, decent citizens in this community. I grew up here. My mother grew up here. She's 96. Came here when she was five. They lived the American dream here. My grandparents came from Denmark. 
I have friends in the community that are reasonable, good people that are concerned. They're not rumor mongers. They just have concerns. And if they don't get the information they need, then when they hear something, they can't know. So it's your responsibility to make sure we have the information that we need to not make incorrect assessments. The fact that you volunteered your time, that's great. But it needs to be heard and needs to be seen. And I think that would be helpful to everybody. Thank and you. And calm a lot of people's feelings and concerns. Yeah. And I would like to say the gentleman that was here before, I heard him, his comments, I agree 100%. We have people that, that are invested in this community, that have worked for the community, that people love here, that have done a good job for the city and have been honorable in their, in their responsibilities. And that should count for something. It shouldn't just be the bottom line. And it's very important because that's who solving is. That's who we are, who we've always been. And I think it's real important to remember that and try to continue that tradition. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more physical speakers? Sorry, Matt, you have public comment? Is there another physical speaker? This, okay. okay. We have Zoom, though. But we still have Zoom. Got it. We do. Anyone wants to speak now? Okay. Well, uh, good morning, Mayor Toussaint. Thank you, and Council Members Matt Vanderland and your Public Works Director and City Engineer. Uh, so I, I, I apologize if this is not the um, best way to communicate. I wasn't sure if I how to make a comment on this. So I told Zena I'd like I, to. I think this is a public comment because it's individual Matt's opinion right now. Uh, well, I, I really just wanted to make a request. Um, I took a uh, kind of quick review of the um, CalPERS report, and I think Joe and John did a very good job. I think it's a very good report. Uh, they're obviously very knowledgeable, much more knowledgeable than me. Um, and obviously there is a problem with CalPERS. Uh, so the one thing I thought was missing was any kind of um, recommendation regarding um, Solvang's involvement or participation in a statewide legislative solution. So I've read a little bit about what they did several years ago in New Jersey, and it was really difficult, but they implemented a statewide um, legislation uh, to help um, solve part of the problem. It didn't fix it completely, but it solved part of the problem. And um, I don't know anybody that's as much of experts as these guys. I'm pointing to the screen, sorry. But, um, <laughs> I, uh, that guy? <laughs> <laughs> but um, other, than these, other than those two gentlemen, but I would be interested, um, and so my request to the city council is, is to, if, if he could, or if they could provide uh, at least their suggestion or their idea or their recommendation of, you know, what would be a, a statewide uh, solution or, or le legislative solution um, that Solvang could then um, get behind or be involved in because I, I myself I think um, Solvang trying to just fix it on our own here that's that's sort of like putting a band-aid you know or something you know it's really a statewide CalPERS um, problem that that needs to be addressed so my request again is if they could uh, do a little addendum to the report in, in, you know, half a page or a page on what statewide um, legislative solution they think would be helpful. Yeah. So, thank, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Are they still on the line? Yes. Because they could answer that in 30 seconds. Seriously, they did that for me when I called Would you them. like to keep going with public yeah, comment? Yeah, public comment. Or go well, I wanted to finish up. If anyone wants to speak now because they have to get to other, other obligations, then that's allowing that opportunity now. Okay, is there anybody, if you're on Zoom, if you could use the uh, raise your hand button, and if you're on phone, we'll take you last and we'll unmute. Anybody on Zoom? Hi there, I'm on Zoom. Okay. Uh, I'm here to sound council members. I'm Daryl Sheck, city taxpayer and resident. I'm just concerned that this city has hired a consultant whose conclusions just kind of align with some of the police on council rather than getting all the information that's out there. Um, there's public information that's out there that, that could be um, helpful with regards to this. Um, I'm wondering how much the consultant report regarding the pension uh, costs um, actually cost the city. And then I'm also 
wondering why the actual CalPERS actuarial reports that are available online for free to the city and actually authored by CalPERS actually aren't part of the council package from what I could see. Um, typically the actuarial reports from CalPERS come out in July. The last one came out in July of 2019. No. And CalPERS typically gives many presentations or they give presentations to government entities across the state at the behest of the entity. And I just wanted to know if the city's actually asked or engaged CalPERS to give a presentation to the council, um, the administration and the staff. And typically those presentations are presented at no cost to the employer from what I understand. It simply involves contacting CalPERS. So I'm wondering just if, if the council's done that. Um, I'd also like to say that um, while I'm sure they're respected in many circles, uh, Mr. Anation and Mr. Holtzman, I think there's just some things that are cherry picked here. Um, for example, the funded ratio being flat, that's largely because of the shortening and the amortization period. Um, it used to be, I believe up to 30 years and now it's 20. And then also lowering the discount rate down to 7%. That actually in decreases the funded ratio so, you know, CalPERS tries to do the right thing and then no, un, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. Um, also, um, with regards to just pension benefits being lost, pension benefits aren't lost. This is money that's spent in the community. It supports local businesses. And I think bailing out or, you know, considering options that are bailing on pensions, you know, of your employees, that's a disservice to your employees as, as a prior speaker. Uh, indicated. Also, there has been pension reform. PEPRA, the Public Employees Pension Reform Act, took place January, it came into effect January 1st of 2013. Employers are required to pay half the normal cost of their pensions through those pension plans. So there has been pension reform that has taken place in recent years. And um, I just don't want this, this city to go down the road of taking this crisis, this COVID crisis, and just just blaming it on CalPERS. Um, there are plenty of other, and it is a complex problem. There are plenty of municipalities suffering. Um, CalPERS no doubt has its own issues, but to go down that road and um, try and, and even consider options that eliminate employee pensions is a complete disservice to long-term employees in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak now? Anyone else on Zoom? Can we unmute everybody for the phone in case there's anybody on the phone? Anyone on the phone would like to speak? Okay, we can mute it back. That's just okay. someone listening. Yeah, yeah. Delay. So that okay. concludes uh, public comment. So with that, uh, is it, we'll go back to the... Um, yes, if yeah. we could do each section separately. So Joe and John, are you still on the line with us? So we can have a discussion with the council and questions? Yes. Okay. Yes. Did he happen to hear the previous uh, speaker's comments? Joe, did, did you want me to yeah, yeah, if you could spend a little time addressing those, addressing and then also, those. I mean, this has been an ongoing, you know, thing here, um, and we are trying. It's, it's an education thing as well, and we have had Calpers on the phone before. We've we've had them where you know they engaged with the council and we asked them questions and stuff like that. So again, this is just a report from um, from your group here, but there there have been several meetings um, uh, covering this and. It, probably took more heat uh, when we got served by the grand jury regarding a letter um, regarding pensions and, and uh, our risk category and things like that. So it has been part of a public awareness um, process and education process. And it is very pertinent to the budgeting for how we um, come up with ways to, to fund these things and, and work with the unions. So anyway, um, if, if you could uh, maybe address some of those, uh, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. Um, I, I understand, uh, number one, that CalPERS is available to you, and I think you should take advantage of them at every opportunity. They do, um, I think, much better work than they did a few years ago. It, it is a changed organization in the sense that they are not as uh, resistant to changing the way that they operate. And they, they moved in the right direction. So the, those are the good things I will say about 
helpers. Um, I will also say, however, that they have been slow to implement those reforms. I know that the previous speaker talked about PEPRA, and uh, which was uh, you know uh, approved in 2013. Uh, I actually looked at PEPRA pretty closely at the time, and I don't have those notes in front of me. But I remember I remember actually a direct conversation with the governor that I had, and uh, I said that I thought that PEPRA solved about five percent of the problem, uh, and so it. it sort of points the ship in the right direction, but it doesn't move it very far. Uh, I do think that the reduction of the discount rate is a step in the right direction. And, and CalPERS has done something else that, that, again, is another step in the right direction. They actually have something called a risk mitigation <laughs> policy. It's in my report of the appendix, appendix A. And if they perform better than 9%, two points better than their target, they will actually, the next year, reduce the discount rate by 0.05%. So for example, if they got 10% uh, this year, the next year they would reduce from 7 to 6.95. So they sort of slowly are moving in the right direction. The problem with that is slowly. It, it's, it's a, you know, it is, it is a very, it's much too slow for them to make anything, you know, to have any meaningful results from that. Um, the amortization period, again, they've made the right decision by moving from 30 years when you lose money and create that amortization tranche to go from a 30 year to a 20 year uh, amortization period. That is a step in the right direction. Uh, but again, um, this is the Titanic that's already going down. Uh, I would say it, 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 a 20 year amortization period is still too long. I mean, imagine you as a consumer, if you said, well, I built up this credit card debt of $100,000, whatever it is, I think I'll just pay it off over 20 years. 20 years is an awfully long time. And you end up shifting costs to the next generation um, uh, you know, not just the next generation of people who live there, the residents, the taxpayers, but the next generation of workers. So that 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 person you hire in two years is going to be paying for the pension of the person who quit this year or quit ten years ago, and that's arguably not fair. Um, I uh, the, the other thing I will say is that uh, I I don't want um, I come from a family of public Literally every one of my family, my mother, my father, my two brothers, either are or were public employees. My younger brother just retired as a firefighter. And I know how important it is to protect the pensions that people in the public sector have and that they've earned. The problem with the argument of saying, well, let's just sort of keep those off the table and keep those discussions off the table is that you have to bring liabilities into discussion. You have to have some discussion about liabilities because this is not a problem that will be fixed with assets. You cannot invest your way out. I think that was originally the thought that CalPERS and CalSTRS and others had, but there's simply no way that you can invest your way out of this. Wait, and Joe, so Joe, I want to make, Joe, I want to put this in layman's terms. So what you're, I think yeah. you're telling us is that there's no way that they can grow their way out of this liability problem. Correct. That's what the thinking was. That, that was the prevailing view in CalPERS and CalSTRS until a few years ago. Uh, it is no longer the prevailing view because I think they understand that, that, um, that they are just in, that, that, that the hole is too deep to use John. And, and to be clear, the only way to fill that hole is to do what? Three options. The only way to fill the hole is to address both the asset side and the liability side. You can't just, you can't just say, let's, let's shoot for 7% and see what happens. You have to do the best you can do with a reasonable amount of risk on the asset side. But you also have to have discussions on the, the liability side. And, and, that, and that leads to discussion about benefits. And you know, I, I will just. Uh, I had a conversation with a, a senior actuary uh, in the public sector fairly recently, and what he said to me was, "The benefits we had were just fine. We didn't need an expansion of benefits, but as we I talked about in the in the report talked about today, 
they were expanded significantly about 20 years ago. And um, I, I guess what I would say is I think employees and, and employee associations, and I'm a former labor union representative as well, they have to be part of the solution. Unless they step forward and they're part of the solution, then they will end up like the employees in Stockton who lost their health, the retirees lost their health, retiree health care because of the bankruptcy that they went through. They will end up like the employees and the retirees in Detroit who lost more than that. There were actually clawbacks. So there are people in Detroit who were actually having to dig into their assets to the tune of $100,000 to pay back the city because, uh, because the hole was so deep. That does not serve anybody. I mean, everyone ought to sit down at the bargaining table, acknowledge the problem, and figure out a way to, to, to work through it. You for, you for, Joe, you forgot to mention the fact that this is being thrown back on the cities, so the cities are gonna be expected to increase taxes, and actually we're already doing that now, but that's gonna be a major uh, demand by the unions, by the CalPERS, right, to fill in that hole. Yeah, why was that not option number four, to raise taxes? It, no, you could, um, you could raise taxes. No, we don't have we're, a choice. We're not going to, but I just think I'm surprised that wasn't one of the options. What? To raise taxes? Mm-hmm. Um, it could be. I don't know. I mean, we did, I didn't look at your get your tax structure or your revenue situation, but you right. could do that. I mean, and there are communities who have done that. So for example, the city of Oakland, uh, the town of San Anselmo and Wren, um, they actually have a levy that they collect every year that goes directly to pay pensions. Yeah. And I, I have to say though, I am not a proponent of, of raising taxes. I'm just throwing it out there as a devil's advocate because I, I don't want to raise taxes. Well, I was, I, just, making, I was simply making Joe make the point that you can only fill the hole one of several ways. And unfortunately, a lot of communities are being forced to do that by raising taxes, like Lompoc. They've been forced to either raise uh, taxes on the community one way or another, but like, like using sales taxes. That's not something I think this council wants to do. And we certainly don't want to pay uh, retirees on the back of the community. That wasn't what they signed up for. So there's got to be better ways out of this mess. And, I, and unfortunately, you know, this is really a bad form and a, and a way of explaining to the people who've come and asked some really good, tough questions. It would have been nice to have the CalPERS representative here to explain themselves. Why is CalPERS broken? And it's not PEPRA. The PEPRA plan is doing fine. It's not the safety plan. It is the miscellaneous plan, right? And we yes. didn't have enough time or information, I guess, to make that distinction. But we need to, I think, going forward. No, I, I think um, our consultants have made um, the point of the fact that the problem of unfunded liability comes from the miscellaneous plan. Our PEPRA plan is still doing well, yet it still is subject to future unfunded liability. And then we also have the problem with OPEB. Unfortunately, the cost of providing health care is rising faster than the return on investments, the return on assets. So once again, the city's liabilities are unfortunately going to continue to rise. And so what choice does the city have but to look at the number of employees, the headcount, and how we take care of this? And then finally, CalPERS is just a, a bad investment. This is like, um, I mean, there are so many wonderful tools out there where they provide a hedge, a floor against loss when the markets go down. Many institutions, hedge funds, you name it, they all use it. CalPERS just doesn't seem to know how to do it. And so they continuously lose money in good times and bad times. I, I don't understand how they could only earn 5% annually for the last five years when the average return was over 10%. And John, if you're still online, if we could also, before we move on, um, give a little bit of information on the legislative efforts ever since CalPERS changed the, the rate of return over the last several years. There's been a lot of effort and <coughs> legislative uh, efforts, but nothing has come to fruition thus far. And we've also had a couple of cases that were hopeful. So if you're still there, if you could give a little brief explanation on that. Dina and John, I, John, could I just jump in real quick? One last thing on this tax issue. Just, just uh, so we didn't look at this explicitly. I've done that before in other studies, and I remember one I did for the city of San Jose uh, on the city of San Jose several years ago. The the increase in taxes is 
typically enormous. It is huge. I, I, I'm having to dig way back because this was a report several years ago, but I believe that we were looking at a one and a half percent increase in the sales tax in San Jose to cover half of their pension costs. So, I mean, it, 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 it's, you know, it is a, it, it's a way, you know, you can, a city can do that, but you've got, you know, two obstacles. One is a very large number and number two, um, you know, you, you have to have voters approve that obviously. Yeah. So on, on the issue of, uh, you know, additional, uh, CalPERS changes, et cetera. So first of all, uh, there is discussion within CalPERS, and I, and I want to say just a, a brief rejoinder to the, you know, this is not a criticism, in my view, uh, of CalPERS' current management. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot, uh, I've lived through a lot with CalPERS, and there's certainly a lot to criticize in some of their past management, but I would say that their current management under Marcy Frost has been really, you know, uh, good and uh, that they, uh, you know, are, are honestly trying to balance a lot of very difficult things. In the same way I say you don't have a silver bullet, they don't have a silver bullet. Uh, they kind of are where they are, and, and with respect to their, you know, not stellar returns, their problem is that they have a maturing workforce or maturing <laughs> Uh, retiree base uh, that uh, requires, as, as your base gets older and we're, we have an aging population and baby boomers are aging out, et cetera, they have to uh, try to find safer investments and they have to de-risk the pool, which is what they what they have done. The problem with de-risking the pool is the same thing that happens when any of us uh, you know, diversify our portfolio. Uh, which is that they can't afford to just throw their money in the S&P uh, because the downside risk is too great. So in, in fairness to them, uh, you know, really this is not a criticism of, of, of their current management. It's just, it's a statement of where we are. So you're, uh, uh, so where they are. So you're telling us. They're aware of that. So you wait, 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 wait. I want to make this this comparison. Is this similar to the problem with Social Security, where you have fewer and fewer paying into Social Security, and at the same time you have people living much, much longer? Yes, it's exactly the same issue, uh, and and that's right. And and so the problem becomes, you know, that they're a little darned if you do, darned if you don't. There are other people who said, you know, well, they should just be charging more. Uh, because they're essentially undercharging, or they're not moving quickly enough to to lower the discount rate. And you know they have, uh, in addition to going from seven and a half to seven, uh, which they've just recently done, there is, as you probably know, a risk management plan which essentially says that any time that they simplify this, but any time they're doing more than ten percent, uh, that they uh, they will lower the discount rate a little bit more by basically a relatively small amount. So they're, you know, they're aware of this. The difficulty is, you know, as, as cities, um, we're a little conflicted uh, because um, as much as, you know, we feel that we should be putting aside or paying really what, what the true discount rate is going to be or the amount of money, you know, uh, that, that, that's commensurate with that, um, you know, uh, many cities, um, and now, now you're probably one of them, uh, have, have a difficulty absorbing uh, these, 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 these higher rates. And so, you know, in fairness to CalPERS, I, they're aware of all of this, and they're, you know, and they are also aware uh, in the current management, I won't say that about previous management, but they, you know, they've been very good, and I don't know how many of you have been at, at sessions where Marcy has spoken, but I mean, you know, they, they're, they're, they're very good about understanding that their job is to go out and make money, to make the nut, to, to keep the rates in line, and that if they don't, that, you know, and they're very, I, I mean, I don't want to say worried, but that, that they, you know, are very aware of the risk here, because, you know, if, if we have a very bad recession and we drop to, let's say, below a 50% funded ratio, you know, the conventional wisdom uh, is really that free hard to come back. Uh, and, and even so, as Joe said, you know, 
we're at a point where we're, we're you know, we're not going to make the nut. There's not going to be zero unfunded liability uh, for a long time to come, and it just means that these costs are coming on us. So anyway, long and short of it, that's number one. Number two, uh, you know, the, the issue that got raised about um, uh, about the uh, you know employees is, is obviously a very, very, very important one. Um, but we also have to remember that. Um, Pensions are for employees, and so uh, whether you're talking about whatever act you're talking about, you're talking about giving employees greater assurance of a funded amount because an unfunded pension is not worth the same as a funded pension uh, because there's risk, and 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 we have to be honest and legitimate about the fact that there's risk, and that that risk ultimately doesn't fall just on the city, but it also falls on the employees of the city. And so very important to understand that that, that what we are doing, is, is, at least in terms of what we're talking about, is for the employees. And in order to uh, uh, to ensure that whatever promise we do make good point. is a promise we can keep. Uh, <laughs> sorry, now, is any of you had some question, and now I've lost it. I was just talking about a, a brief uh, overview of legislative efforts and uh, key court cases. So yeah, so so we are very involved uh, as a firm in uh, the litigation uh, in the Cal Supreme Court. Uh, there have been uh, there's a case called Cal Fire, which was decided last year, uh, and there's a case uh, called Alameda, which was argued three weeks ago, uh, and they are essentially companion. So Cal Fire um, addressed uh, the question of, in essence, what aspects of pension liabilities are, are vested. And this is an area, and when we say vested, what we're talking about is the promise, uh, everybody, whatever anybody's earned, they've already earned. There's no issue about that whatsoever, of course. Uh, the issue is for current employees, and of course, new employees, you can do whatever you want. Um, the issue is for current employees, for their future service, service they have not yet rendered, is there flexibility in, uh, in, in uh, nego you know, to negotiate uh, trade-offs? And uh, this is still oddly, despite how important of an issue it is, a very open area. Uh, the, the traditional understanding you know, had been that no, you could not do that. Uh, you could not negotiate that. But the case law has never been and um, the court is, is working its way through it. So in the Cal Fire case, the court held that CalPERS's airtime uh, 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 benefit, which got wiped out in PEPRA, uh, that it was not a violation of vested rights to have wiped out that benefit. Uh, in the Alameda case, they're looking at various spiking uh, in 37 uh, uh, so, uh, uh, accounts. So, so Little by little, uh, the court is addressing this question of might there be flexibility uh, around uh, negotiating trade-offs? Because you also have to understand that that given this tremendous liability, um, you know, we're, we're, we're reaching a point where we're not going to be able to give much of anything in the way of raises to employees. So, so the real question, even even for you know. Uh, 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 strongest of unions is, is don't, don't we want, or do we want, I guess this question, um, uh, some flexibility to trade off wages now for addition, you know, for, for some of these benefits in the future? And again, that's, a, that's a, a, an open question. Uh, so, so all of that, we're looking for this Alameda case. It should come down in less than 60 days. Uh, I'm not sure that it's going to answer any of the really big questions because it, it, it actually turns on some fairly specific facts and I'm expecting the court to, uh, uh, to issue a, a narrow ruling that you know, a lot of folks probably expect to down. As far as legislation, there has not been much in the way of legislative activity post PEPRA uh, for uh, there to be you know, uh, additional uh, additional changes. I think a lot of us are looking at, um, you know, uh, of course there, there have been periodically discussions about ballot measures, uh, particularly in addressing the California rule. There's ongoing conversation about that throughout the state. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know whether that's going to go and pass. It just kind of fizzled out. 
I think the conventional wisdom has been that if we have a major economic downturn, all of those issues would be back on the table. But currently, there's not a lot of that. Okay. Are there any questions of the council? I just have one comment. Okay. When you talk about taking things back to the legislature and having them try and fix it up, it just it, it makes me laugh because it's you're asking legislators who make their living giving money away and being beholden to special interest groups, putting things in order. It's just not going to happen. I mean, maybe if we see a, a severe economic crisis, then there might be some change. But uh, people don't understand that that the way things work in Sacramento, and and you're not going to get legislative um, relief from this type of a crisis in this political climate. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody understands that there's, you know, a supermajority of Democrats in, uh, um, in the legislature and that absent, you know, a critical need, that that's probably not a place people are going right now. But but, but do recognize that everything that Joe is saying, uh, you had a, one of the people who stood up uh, talked about the fact that this is something that every city is facing, that's right. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are at, you know, going towards a point, even if you take COVID out of the equation, we're <laughs> moving toward a point where uh, cities were struggling uh, to uh, uh, deal with their CalPERS liabilities. Uh, Joe pointed out that CalPERS liabilities have gone, you know, dramatically up. But what's really scary is that even based on CalPERS' own numbers, uh, you're looking at potentially about another 50% increase in cost uh, over the next five years and so um, uh, you know so this just becomes uh, uh, the question is at, at what point you know does that become such a critical problem that the legislature uh, you know has no choice but to act and, uh, and 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 if so what are the actions it could take and that's why what's happening in the courts is so yeah. One of the uh, speakers commented on, um, and don't use COVID as an excuse for this, and I'm thinking, this is <laughs> COVID, this is way, way, way before COVID came around with uh, unfunded liabilities being a huge issue. So the COVID is completely separate from this. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I got no, no other questions, we'll uh, continue on the rest of the budget. I have just a quick question. Okay. Oh. So I um, thought it was a very thorough uh, presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I have a question. Something that kept coming up over and over again was um, there's no way of investing ourselves out of this. So with that mindset, Any stocks. with that mindset, um, does that kind of um, discourage uh, the uh, plan, one, one, the 115 plan, long range investment, or is that something that you would uh, encourage the city to continue um, doing? John, do you want to go or do you want me to uh, why don't you Why don't you take a first shot at that? I, I mean, I think, you know, my short answer is that anything you can do to put money aside is useful. There, you know, the, 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 the constraints that most agencies have is they don't have any spare cash. Um, but uh, in as much as you can do that, I think that's a good thing to do because it's it's restricted funds. The, the employees and the retirees will think it's a good step because it protects them. Um, so I would continue to do that. The challenge, of course, is finding the revenue. If you were, if you were, if you, you know, if you were Palo Alto, uh, a fairly wealthy city, it would be easier. The city of Palo Alto, in fact, is funding their CalPERS obligations today as though they're um, were a 6.2 percent rate of return, and they're putting money aside, assuming that someday they'll need that. But they they have a you know they have a tax structure or tax base that permits them to do that. Um, if you can do that, that's great. But that's tough to do typically. Yeah, and, and let me just say, I, I was going to say the exact same thing, which is, uh, you know, I, the, the most logical structure in my mind, uh, you, you have an actual uh, or, or you have Joe, uh, uh, figure out what is is the 6.25 percent, uh, you know, number, uh, and and you simply fund at that rate as though that's the rate, and that's your very best protection. Uh, 
uh, and it, you know it's an actuarial determined number, and and you you really should be uh, doing that. And I think it makes I think on balance a 115 plan is better than putting the money in CalPERS uh, because you have more control and because if everything goes to hell, you still have the ability to take that money and actually use it to make contributions. Okay, thank you. That's exactly the answer that I wanted to hear. Thank you. What's the probability that uh, CalPERS will reduce the discount rate to something more in line with what actuarialists, industry actuarialists require, which is more like 5 or 6%? And why won't they do that? Um, the probability of CalPERS doing that in the next 5 to 10 years is close to zero. Um, I, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, they had been reluctant to do that in part because of the pain that it would uh, result in in their member agencies. Member agencies would see the contribution requirements increase. And in fact, one of the reasons that CalPERS has not moved more aggressively on lowering the discount rate is because they've gotten pushback from agencies out there. So what would that do to the city of Solving, one of those municipal agencies that you talk about? If, if, they, if, if the discount rate were dropped to 5%? Well, even to 6%. How would that affect our um, ongoing expenses? For example, the catch-up expenses related to the unfunded liabilities and the normal costs. Right. I mean, this, I, mean, I didn't calculate this, but my, my guess is that it would probably add, if you went from 7 to 6, right. uh, it would probably add about another... 40% or so to your rate, something along those lines. Could you do that? That would be very helpful. I, can, I, can, I, can, I, I can't do it in my head, but I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the reason why I, say, I ask is because I think the community really doesn't get, doesn't understand what this council is facing, what this community is facing. As much as we'd like to give generously to our employees, there's no bottomless checkbook here. Uh, the taxpayers ultimately have to cover this cost. So we're trying to figure out a way to minimize that as best we can. So, a council member, could I just, so one, I can give you a very short answer, you know, without doing the, 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 the uh, exact calculations for a 5%. I, I did, uh, uh, in just the last couple of minutes, calculate the implicit annual rate of return that is in the unfavorable scenario, which is the scenarios, if you remember, that reduces the rate of return from 7% to 4% for those three years for 2022, 23, and 24. That works out to about 5.5% investment rate of return over this period through the year 2027. So, and so you, if you, you know, if you looked at that chart that, that we had and, uh, that I showed that's in the report that shows your contribution rates under the unfavorable, it got up to about 35% roughly uh, under that, about 5% greater than the baseline case. So that's a, that's a pretty good estimate of what it would cost you if you were to move to 5.5%. That's, that's a rough number because there's some other moving parts, but that's a rough number. The, the, other, the other loose end I wanted to, to talk about is a council member, you had asked uh, about the impact of different discount rates on the termination liability. If the, if, the, if the termination discount rate were about 5%, your termination cost, uh, instead of being 30 or $40 million today, would be closer to about 13 or $14 million today. So if, if the long, if that discount rate, if treasury rates were about 5%, it would be about, you know, thir let's say $13 million to, to exit calipers. Just to, and, and I'll, I'll put that together in a, in a, uh, a chart of some kind of send it to uh, your city manager. Fantastic. Thank you for doing that. Sure. Oh, wait, one last question. Given your expertise in, in economics and finance, as a professor at Stanford University, what is your take on long-term rates, given the fact that they've been declining for the last 20-plus years? Will they continue to decline or stay flat, or do you think they're going higher? I, I, I don't know. 
<laughs> that I and everyone else wish they knew, right? But I, I just don't know. I mean, I think that certainly it's, it's a possibility that we're seeing in other parts of the world. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I really don't specialize on, the, on the, the macro side of things. And I do some work on the investment side and so forth. But, uh, uh, but that's, there are, there are some colleagues who could do a much better job than I, but I should probably not speculate. Great answer. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Can we uh, <clears throat> move on with the rest of the staff report? Yes. Okay. Thank you, John. Joel? Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to turn to the second part of the presentation, which is the operating budget discussion uh, and just kind of overall budget overview. Uh, and then we'll move over to a more specific discussion of the capital improvement program that's been amended and special projects. So the financial plan is focused uh, around council goals and policy direction established for the current fiscal year 1920 in June of last year and is based on subsequent council more specific policy direction provided throughout the year. So the statements are the focus areas that I have kind of highlighted in this report in this presentation are really uh, language that I've developed from all the direction you've been given throughout the year. So if it's not your adopted language, if there's anything you would like to tweak, change, that's definitely for your discussion today uh, as you make final recommendations for funding allocations. So um, focus area number one that I've been hearing that I think we've been working on is the fiscal responsibility. First point here is in response to unprecedented declaration of national emergency for COVID-19, you have already taken the action of uh, directing to reduce staff operations to essential services only. The next bullet point here is to continue to develop strategies to lower operating costs, including pension and post-retirement health costs. That's a, the discussion of the last two hours that we've spent uh, just talking about the pension. And yes, obviously there is also um, the post-retirement costs, the OPEB for health, that's also $2 million, which is fairly significant for our size. Um, the next point is to pursue regional opportunities to take advantage of economies of scale when feasible for the following services. So uh, two of our major services that are essential, are of course, the water and wastewater. Um, and there's been discussions from you to look at opportunities for uh, potentially creating JPEs or other solutions uh, that create uh, economies of scales with um, working with other agencies in the region. And then recreation is an, a service where we already have kind of a combined uh, services with Buellton that's actually serving uh, not only Buellton and Solving, but our two cities are kind of picking up that workload for the entire va valley of Santa Ines. So I think that's important to remember. And there may be opportunities for us to also be more collaborative uh, regionally. And then the final point on fiscal responsibility is to uh, update all the general fund fees, including planning, building, recreation, and cost allocation. Actually, all of the fees in the city have not been updated in a long time, especially when it comes to the general fund fees. Those haven't been updated since 2004 and 2005. And generally speaking, the city should never go um, longer than five years to update those. So we don't have uh, an idea at this point of how much we are really capturing back. Then uh, the next uh, focus area that I've identified, I think, is the desire to have more efficient operations and speci specifically focusing on two f areas of operations in the city, one being planning and building department where we've been making progress, but there's still much to go. So uh, the two suggestions here and the budget focuses on these two uh, processes is to continue to do business process re-engineering, including updating internal policies and procedures and the municipal code. So we have, uh, or actually we don't have written policies and procedures right now for planning and building. So that is something that we should have and should develop. And then we also have the municipal code that seems to have been updated at times that is, um, not uh, very cohesive and, and needs to be also looked at. Um, and we've, we've been doing some of those updates as we go along. For example, you just updated your ordinance that made it uh, easier to expand the patios places uh, on Mission Drive or in town generally. 
Um, and that is the kind of um, work that we'll need to continue. Then also we have the transition from completely paper-based operations. So I'm finding out that all of our um, planning and building, especially planning, is on paper. Uh, and so you have authorized us to implement dude solutions, which will automate uh, the processes, but we also need to have a uh, significant effort getting all of those paper documents, plans, approvals, everything that we have into an electronic uh, database, which means a lot of scanning and filing and numbering things. Uh, so that will be an effort. Uh, another area where we've been, we have been making a lot of progress is information technology. Information technology was, of course, um, um, quite outdated, uh, and we've been making improvements in uh, updating our, our cybersecurity. Uh, at the next council meeting, you'll actually see a response from the city to a grand jury report that found all cities in Santa Barbara County to be lacking cybersecurity. We've <coughs> made lots of progress there, but there still needs to be more, uh, such as having a strategic plan for cybersecurity. Uh, we're also working on data management and security, ensuring that we have very clear understanding of where our, da our data lives and how we back that up. Uh, we will also need to continue to update this council chamber and hopefully not have to use a projector. Uh, there is an update for city website, updates to city internal cable and internet infrastructure and utilization of information technology to, to improve efficiencies in operations. The next area is communications. Uh, this year the council had added communications efforts uh, through a couple of different contracts and so the idea here is to continue to improve on city communications both by updating the city website but also continue to review the communications policy and creating processes that better communicate information to the public um, on consistent and regular basis. Um, the next focus area three is having a balanced economic development. So uh, you have been uh, given different direction throughout the year to uh, seek opportunities to expand on experiential tourism and raise revenue per visitor to expand outdoor space for businesses, especially right now with COVID-19 so that our businesses can continue to operate at at least the same levels as they have before, but of course to continue uh, to grow that revenue per, per visitor as well. And then also with public input to seek opportunities to enhance local economy and to update the general plan that hasn't been updated in um, about 20 years in some elements and to develop economic development strategies that continue to um, better the city of solving and uh, to expand the benefit to our residents. Uh, financial focus number four would be to address infrastructure needs, so to invest in needed infrastructure with strategies or with strategic funding methodologies focusing on lower long-term costs. So you have directed to move forward with phased-in water treatment plant upgrades so that we are in phased manner uh, are increasing those costs while investing in this very needed infrastructure. Water and wastewater master plan updates uh, to understand our uh, system, especially as we move with any uh, type of economic development efforts. Uh, pavement maintenance, you received a report earlier this year, so that's a continuation to work on, on those findings and make sure that we are continue to invest in our pavement. Um, parking study and developing strategies and in, in invest in, in needed parking to support uh, our businesses uh, and economic development, and then establish designated fund level reserves for operating funds for capital improvement program. So one of the things that the city um, has not utilized historically is a capital improvement fund where there's money set aside specifically for that program. So it, it kind of looks like there's more money just sitting available in the general fund um, than we, re we really need to start designating some of that money for that very very uh, need of investing in infrastructure and in our other major operating funds, which are water and wastewater as well. So have you done that at least in, in, in a rough draft so we can see how that affects the unassigned reserves? Uh, I have a couple of recommendations, so I will run you okay. through this. All right. 
And then, of course, uh, financial plan focus number five is marketing and tourism. So that's the new contract uh, that you have entered into uh, with IDK. And some of the areas of focus there are to improve process for events permitting and work with community to receive input and proposed event through a steering committee. That steering committee has been established uh, to establish key performance indicator to show return on investment for city funds. So being data driven, establish a cap on marketing and tourism expenditures tied to direct, directly to transit occupancy tax revenue collected by the city, which has been done capped at 12% of actually collected dollars. Uh, to build a new Solving USA website is in the scope for the next year. And then to uh, work on experiential marketing, including citywide marketing services, targeted marketing, weekly experiences in solving, including cultural wine tasting, family friendly and outdoor activities. Um, so we've put together the numbers for the financial plan for uh, the next two years, uh, 2020, 21, and then 21, 22. Uh, all the detail that you see here is worked into these numbers. These numbers include all of the recommendations for um, operating expenditures that you see, as well as for capital improvement program and special projects. And so you will see here the top part is revenue for all of the funds, and then the bottom is the expense. And what I really would like to point out on this slide is just the bottom line um, at the very bottom where it says net, which is total revenue over total expenditure for all funds in the city. And it's just one way of looking at it for the entire budget. But you will see that in the current year, we are $1.2 million negative citywide. It's different fund by fund. Um, and that's due to the loss in the general fund, uh, due to TOT and sales tax because of COVID-19. And then there was some actually positive impact on other funds, especially in water to where we had a little bit of a nice break in our water payment this year, just because they do periodic true ups. And this year um, it was a positive. So overall, all funds, we are 1.2 million negative. In the next year, the proposed budget draws on balances by $2.6 million, but you have to remember that within that is all of the capital improvement program, so it's, it's normal uh, to draw on fund balances when you have large projects. One of the larger projects there is the wastewater treatment plant engineering study. And then in the second year of the financial plan, you're still drawing by $1.8 million. So generally speaking, this budget is um, structurally in the in the general fund is balanced uh, at the water and, and wastewater fund. We we are very close in the wastewater in the water fund. We are actually our revenues over the long run are lower there than our expenditures, uh, but we do have uh, um, very healthy fund balance. So there is no immediate uh, need to correct that. Uh, potential ongoing imbalance, but it's something to definitely uh, keep attention on. So this chart here shows, uh, it starts on the top with uh, unrestricted fund balance as of uh, 6.30.19, uh, and it's first general fund and government impacts fees, water and wastewater. And really the government impact fees I have here because um, it there really needs to be a transfer to fund those projects from the general fund. So you can kind of look at those uh, as one and together because those negatives in that fund would have to be funded by general fund. There's not enough fund balance from any government impact fees to, to fund those projects. Uh, so you will see that you know we are forecasting, um, drawing some money in the current year uh, based on our revenues shortfall and then expenditures, we have some savings. Uh, we will draw over a million dollars in our reserves and then the next financial year for general fund is balanced uh, given the uh, reductions that we took in operations already uh, and some additional reductions that I will introduce in this report. Uh, and then the following fiscal year is also balanced for uh, the general fund. And then in water, you see that even though we continue to draw over the next uh, financial plan here, uh, our reserves still remain pretty healthy, uh, but we are uh, structurally imbalanced. And then on the wastewater 
plant or wastewater uh, fund, we are actually starting to see some negatives at the end of the fiscal year. So that would be something that we will need to address uh, as we move forward with larger project of the wastewater treatment plant uh, and uh, fee study as well. So um, just in some of these sheets before the next um, budget hearing, I'm just wondering if maybe you can add between revenues and expenditures just a or somewhere in there just just showing how much that is coming out in terms of capital cost because that's you know right now the way it looks it might just look like it's off balance in the water or wastewater but you know obviously we have a large capital improvement project going on there right now but you know the city has saved up some reserves um, to be used for that so obviously as you undertake that project you're going to see uh, you know a draw off of the the reserves there but I I just kind of want to see from my own understanding of the health of the fund um, revenue versus normal operation operating um, type cost and then to also see the capital cost so I can see the optional um, items that we are undertaking right now sure yeah I will include that for the next uh, report um, so this is a summary of the actions that you already committed to uh, and took before once again you um, directed to reduce ongoing operating costs by a million dollars in non-essential services and move to essential services only. You already entered into a contract with IDK or have approved to enter into a contract with IDK, which will be on consent agenda of your next meeting on Monday for the 2021 fiscal year. It's a one-year contract and it is uh, capped at 12% of receipts. So as we slowly begin to recover from COVID-19, uh, those expenditures will be capped based on the number of dollars for transient occupancy tax that we actually collect. And that's estimated at just uh, over $300,000 um, in the next year because we expect that it will take a full year, assuming there's not additional impacts from COVID-19 for us to begin to uh, see the levels of um, tourism that we uh, had prior to COVID-19. You also directed staff to address unfunded liabilities. Uh, we had uh, the discussion in, as part of this presentation on pensions. Uh, we also need to have a discussion on OPEB and you can provide with any additional direction for next steps there um, today. And then we while, while you're there, I'd just like to request that we get um, uh, CalPERS representatives on the phone next, um, next meeting. We've done it in the past, but I think now would be the appropriate time to do it again. Okay. There's a typo on Overhoy too. Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, you have limited grant program to humanitarian services only with focus on senior services and the director of staff to enter into negotiations with Everhorn Museum for ongoing partnership and you've already actually approved that contract with them. So now I'd like to just give you some highlights on salaries and benefits that are and not are not any longer included in this proposed budget. So this first slide is based on the level of expenditures for fiscal year 1920. Those are the 12 positions that were either already being held vacant uh, prior to COVID-19 or that were layoffs as uh, a result of COVID-19. So those were the annual salary is the first column, uh, the benefits and the total expense, and it shows you an hourly rate uh, of those positions. And so the city is on an ongoing basis now saving $1.2 million. And actually it would be 2.5% um, higher uh, on a portion of this because there is an MOU that gives uh, a raise um, in this current or in the next financial uh, plan. So these are the proposed budgeted salaries and benefits that are loaded into this budget and proposed to move forward with fi this financial plan. Um, I would just like to note here on the left uh, that city manager and public works are the two positions that are overtime exempt. We are two salaried positions. All the other positions are hourly positions, so they are subject to overtime if they work more than 40 hours a week or more than eight hours a week in a day. Um, the funding does include, the way it's here, 2.5% uh, increase per the current MOU. If you would recall, last year, uh, the city negotiated a two-year MOU with the union, and so 2.5% was uh, worked into that MOU. 
So it's reflected in these numbers. The city manager salary does not assume an increase, uh, but all the other salaries do on this chart. And um, this cost here does not include uh, the payments that the city is making for unfunded liabilities. So this is all the benefits, um, all the costs, but not inclusive of additional payments that we make to pay off unfunded liability. Could you please so, do that? Yes. Thank you. Now, and there's different models for doing that, but I believe the appropriate way of doing that here, um, given the presentation, would be to kind of break it in um, evenly across, or somehow evenly, or out, or ratio across so I, the... So I, I mean, it used to be, unfunded liability used to be paid uh, until about five years ago as a percent of salaries, but because a lot, of, a lot of times agencies have savings in salaries at the end of the year, they went to a flat dollar amount that they require us to pay. So um, generally speaking, the way to allocate it in this kind of model is just to do a percent of the base salary as a proxy, if that makes sense. So the salaries here, uh, the total expense without unfunded liability again, uh, would be two point, almost $2.8 million for all funds. Now there's some other reductions that we have already. Uh, I'm sorry, one more, th if you go back on that. Um, if we could start separating this out by like general fund, you know, since these are separate enterprise funds mm -hmm. and they're supposed to be run completely separate, um, it'd just be nice if we didn't have a graph that was then everything all together. Because um, we really want to see what specifically is coming out of the general fund and then what's coming out of the, the separate enterprise funds. Right. Sure. And that total dollar amount represents about what the worst baseball player on a major league roster makes. <laughs> One person. Yes. Microphone, please. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions on this chart? Yeah, I, I was using a, my own analysis on Excel, and it, something caught my attention. Maybe you can explain to me. There are some positions where when you divide benefits by salary to get a, a ratio of the benefits for the salary, mm -hmm. they're as high as 91%. I don't want to pick on anyone. Um, we'll just call them a maintenance worker. And I'll, I'll show it to you later because I'm not trying to pick on anyone in particular. It just seems like it's really weird that the benefits would be almost the same as the salary itself. Yeah, and, and I can definitely provide the council with uh, the details or highlights of the benefits out of the MOU. Um, a lot of the variation has to do um, with health insurance, for example, and people who have an individual plan cost the city a lot less than if there is a full family because, uh, and I don't remember exactly right now off my top of my head, but we pay about 80% of the health uh, insurance for the employees. Um, then there's other, you know, longevity pays and other benefits that may impact different people differently. Um. Right, so there's a lot of variation between right. the employees, what you're right. saying. Hmm. Interesting. So that's something I can just distribute probably to council. I mean, it's the same thing you see in private as well. You know, you get, you get someone, you know, it's a family, and someone works for the, the business that provides the better benefits and everything, and then they put the whole family underneath that business's right. benef benefit package, and depending on how that employer d decides to, you know, handle things. Yeah, I, that happens. It's, it happens a lot, but I, it is kind of. It would be interesting to see a little bit more of, of what those what the benefits are compared to the salaries, just because it's it does seem a little bit like ninety percent. Well, for that, little, I don't know. It it's about sixty. It's sixty five percent on average based on that list, which is pretty that. high. Mm -hmm. But ninety one percent for one person is like what, what's well, going on? Well, just to understand there? it a little bit better, having more detail on those yeah. particular. And there's also a floor grade. for benefits because, for example, everyone that everyone receives a housing allowance, and that is a X, brand new hire or X or amount per year. Yes, there are. There is a floor there. Mm -hmm. So the lower the the, the salary is going to be, the closer they'll get to that floor. Yeah. You know, oh, if okay. we provided everyone with fifty thousand dollars a year worth of right of housing benefit, for example, which is not the case, but just to make my point here, but then we hired someone at fifty thousand dollars a year, you're going to see the benefit alone being it's equal be to their the salary. Their salary, yeah. So we do have a floor is what you're saying. 
And well, of course, because if you're if you have several different uh, positions, all ranging from fifty thousand to you know nearly two hundred thousand dollars a year, and you issue out a housing allowance that pays five hundred dollars a month or something like that per employee, then that's automatically a floor of six thousand dollars a month in benefits that they receive just from that you know that thing. So there. it's not based on seniority or merit; it's just given to them right out of the gate. Well, it's. The details are all in the MOU. Yeah. So okay. So you yeah. can go read the MOU, but every year when you go through those negotiations, but also I'll, I will also point out that you know that's that's also a you know something to weigh because for example a housing allowance is not persable. So if you want to tr you know try to control your your PERS liability, then you know personally I'd rather give a housing allowance that's not persable versus you know, something that's, that is personal. Right. That's how, the, I mean, a lot of times in private, they would, they're not going to do a retirement plan even for themselves as a business because it's going to cost too much or they're not going to provide health insurance because the cost to provide it for everyone is drastic. Right. So I, but in this case, obviously that's the way it's done. So. Okay. Um, so some of the other reductions that are already plugged into this budget and to the final, um, Numbers that you see here is that our, our vehicle replacement fund it has a very healthy budget uh, or fund balance, um, and there's really no need to continue to immediately put money into that, and we'll take a closer look going forward as to um, how much money is really needed, especially given that we have made changes in operations. But um, in the next fiscal year, we are saving $175,000, uh, which is a 100% reduction um, from the current year, putting money into the vehicle replacement fund. And then in the next year, um, there is an estimate uh, of only 50% of the previous levels being uh, placed into the vehicle replacement fund, and that's another savings of $87,000. Now, our parks and recreation programs, or rather I should say recreation programs, are assumed at about 50% uh, level of activities in year one, and then ramping up to about 70 and 80%. That's obviously something that we'll continue to work on, but this is just a placeholder. Uh, just to remind you there again, the, the revenue, the fees that we pay or charge for parks have never been 100% cost recovery when it comes to uh, salaries and benefits. Those would only um, you know, cover other costs. So um, as we look at that budget forward, um, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one recovery, but there is some reduction in the costs um, and in revenue assumed uh, for recreation programs. And then all training budgets have been reduced by 50% in the general fund because we had such a significant reduction uh, in workforce, so we don't need quite as much of the uh, training budget. Now moving on to contract services for operations. These are kind of operational pieces that uh, I wanted to present to you um, that would be provided through contract services. Um, I have created a code of blue indicating that it's a, a new service that you haven't had in this fiscal year. Green is just doing an alternative service model for delivery of services, and then red indicates that it's a reduction in the budget for contract services that you have had. So for council, I have here plugged in $20,000 for further modernization of the council chamber video and audio capability. Um, I've plugged in an estimate of $200,000 for legal fees. That's based on a presumption that the legal fees per month would be capped at $25,000 uh, from all sources, general fund and other sources. And then we have this $50,000 for a national um, uh, NDC, which was a contract that you just entered into, but it wasn't actually worked into the current fiscal year budget. So that's an increase that you would be seeing, uh, assuming we'll continue to work with NDC on developing business development, economic development, grant funds, uh, and loan programs. Then in administration, uh, there's $20,000 that we spend just on uh, complying with um, reports that we need for CalPERS and OPEB evaluations to do our financial statements. Uh, I put $60,000 for temporary agency services. Um, majority of that is uh, assuming a part-time deputy city clerk. I have $20,000 public relations budget, which is the same as this year about, uh, for continued 
um, work on public relations, which is currently done by Anna. And then we also have plugged in here a website update at about $35,000 for the general uh, city website. Information technology, our ongoing contract would be just a little bit higher than we had before for information technology services, but it, we do have a lot more services with that contract. Uh, that's an estimate from land speed, and obviously you can either continue contra to contract with that provider or go to an RFP. There's $6,000 for increased bandwidth for our internet, which we really need right now, and then we'll be transitioning into a voice over IP phone system once we have the additional bandwidth for the internet right now we can't do that uh, that has to be the step one then on planning and building in planning we have sixty thousand dollars assumed for legal fees which would be uh, potentially subject to 100 percent cost recovery uh, some of that could be done just by contracting uh, directly for larger projects or uh, we can also amend our fee um, ordinance or resolution for uh, some of the pass on costs to be 100% recovery and then we'll also need to do uh, a fee study for other st fees that are blended to where we really need to have those calculations and then we can go to a 100% cost recovery across all, all of those planning fees. 144000 is estimated for professional planner consultants, so I would just remind you that we have, this budget does not assume a planning director, so this is kind of a replacement contract to provide planning services by a firm and that would also be subject to 100% rec cost recovery if we can update those fees. And then there's $30,000 to uh, accommodate the scanning to go from really inefficient paper-based operations into actually doing things uh, modernly and efficiently. And, Zina, um, I'm sorry, that 144, that's for a team of planning that would be primarily for a planner consultant, which is an experienced consultant in planning, and some additional help, yes, okay. from that firm. Thank you. And then uh, this assumes code enforcement um, at $30,000, which would be a part-time code enforcement uh, contracted out position. And then we have $80,000 for building, which is the building official and inspector services. And those should also be calculated into the fees that get passed on to the customers at 100% once we update those fees. Uh, and that's right now with Will Dan. And that's the same level uh, and basically assumes you know $80,000 in revenue and 80 in expenditures. And when, when will we be able to have it on the agenda for the, um, the fee cost recovery? Well, I think we can do a partial cost recovery for those things that we can directly do as a pass on. That's cost, what I'm looking which for. We just yeah. need to do a proper noticing for that as a public hearing. So, how soon can we have that done? Because I thought we were going to do that like last week. Mr. Mayor, I believe that you already have the ability right now just by changing your application form to charge that pass-through cost. To do the resolution, typically you do that when you have your budget. And so I would urge that you do that the same time you do the budget. So can we have that on the next? So yeah. the, the fees were adopted by a resolution, the fees that are currently in effect. Um, and that resolution was last adopted in 2005. And there, that resolution does not include pass on type of provisions. It's a calculated fees for everything. So we would just need to notice that and we can do that probably for the June 22nd and in this case do it together with the budget hearing. Okay. The regular meeting following the one that's already been noticed, the June 22nd. Correct. June yeah. 22nd. Um, so here I just have, um, actually, uh, I would ask Matt, I forgot to check with him, <laughs> janitorial services have changed. We had a couple of contracts, but I believe it's at $150,000. You can correct me if, if that's not. Um, okay, that is correct, good. Uh, and then for water, I just wanted to point out that we have another $40,000 in legal fees um, being uh, for the water litigation. That's been kind of an ongoing budget, so there's no change uh, in that amount. And with the, because I mean, I get a lot of complaints about janitorial services. Is that, so are we increasing the the level of servicing, especially given the, you know, the current events and making people feel safe and secure to visit Solvang? 
Sure, uh, Mayor Tassant. Sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Really loud. Uh, So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, immediately when um, the COVID nineteen hit, we scaled back. You know, when we when we had the drop in visitors, we scaled way back on the janitorial service, um, both to save money and you know, well, primarily to, to save money. Uh, so we have started to ramp that back up a little bit just recently, but. Um, yeah, we'll we'll have to uh, meet with our contractor and give them additional direction to, to ramp that up now again. So we had ramped way back to save money, and now we're, yeah. So. But I think now, just given the the heightened you know um, sense of uh, cleanliness, we should be doing extra uh, intervals. And then also, we've just already had complaints before about the restrooms not being the cleanest. Um, so you know, I, I think we should be ramping that up further okay. than what we. You know, that's just my opinion. Okay. Yeah, that's so. It's kind of like why we put hand sanitizer all around the, the sidewalk right, and right, stuff like that. Right. So we sh we need to complement those common areas. <clears throat> sure, we can ramp we can ramp that up. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and we are doing that. I think right right now for the immediate months of June, uh, we've had conversations. Uh, I've touched base with our maintenance division well. Matt was on vacation, but I know they've talked to you too. So right now we are doing it, but then for the next year we'll definitely think through that as well as we may continue to see yeah. COVID-19 impacts. Uh, then this just represents the grant program um, and the assumptions in the budget, the numbers that you see plugged in are assumed at the same levels as previous year. Uh, except that there's, there was an increase for the Everhoy Museum for, to $35,000 from 30, and the request from the Solving Senior Center is $50,000. Uh, the process here on the grant uh, applications is definitely delayed this year because of COVID-19. So my plan would be to bring to you or open up this uh, process for any applicants for humanitarian services only and focusing on senior uh, services as you have um, directed before uh, to apply before the next uh, hearing on June 22nd and then you would be able to make your decisions on this. Wait, wait. Yes. So that's it? That's the final result? No, this is not the final result. So this is this is that, what that's we did last year, right? Yeah, this is what you did last year, and then you adopted the policy to where you said this year you only want to focus on oh, humanitarian so you're services. Open it up and then right, we are behind schedule because of COVID nineteen. Normally, you would have done this by now, have had uh, reviewed the applications. So we're just going to do. A but it'll be a shorter list this year, regardless right. of right. because of prior uh, prior year's direction. And then uh, I believe the Elvahoy's already been taken care of. We approved right. their. So that's why I have that in blue that you already approved that contract right. at $35,000. So it'll a be a year. very short list this year. Right. And two. Um, marketing and tourism, uh, you will see that based on the estimates in the revenue for transit occupancy tax, uh, assuming that there is a slow ramp up back to 100% activity throughout the next year. Right now, the estimate that um, the contract with LUK will be uh, at about $358,000. Of course, that's tied to the actual revenues collected. If we do better, then um, IDK will also do better and, and we'll have more work, I'm, I'm sure as well, if we are more reopened and are able to do events versus if we, d we can't, or if we don't collect that money, then they would be owed less money as well. And then there's an assumption for the visitor center at $75,000, um, which is about half of the budget that you had before, so that's something that we would need to look for efficiencies and economies of scale and really not duplicating the efforts. I think uh, there's some activities that IDK does and the visitor center uh, has been doing before COVID-19 uh, that are really duplicative, so hopefully there's some synergy that we can find in those operations. And uh, so I've put in into the budget a request for $75,000, but you can definitely update that as um, you actually 
uh, enter into a contract for those services. And then I just have a plug for economic development as the council continues to have discussions on economic development uh, and consider options for um, land utilization and raising our potential uh, revenues um, that are beneficial to the entire city. I just put $30,000 for an economic development consulting type of services. And then this is uh, really where uh, I have recommendations uh, and proposal for you to fund some additional services. We've made a lot of um, reductions. We've also conducted an organizational study, as you remember, before we got to COVID-19 to where we were talking about how we are providing services. Um, and so the budget right now, you will see that our revenues are at $7.4 million. The expenditures are at 7.3. There's about $106,000 still available. I would like to recommend that um, instead of you know backfilling all of those positions that we have had, uh, because I think it's actually wasn't the best ultimate structure for delivery of services uh, to start with, but my recommendation would be to enter into uh, a two-year contract for a management analyst type of position. So it would be a position that backfills uh, to some degree uh, a number of positions, for example, administrative services director, the city clerk, uh, an executive assistant, to some degree the planning director, to really work on all of these uh, organiz business reengineering, bring us special projects, do the analytical work, uh, do the work of writing some of the reports right now. Um, I'm kind of a one-man writer here, so <laughs> I think it would be, it's a lower level position than a director level position, but I think it would be really the right mix of a position to uh, get some of these things that we need to get done and fixed in um, our administration, our human resources, our IT, planning development, and just get back to efficient, modern, current standard operations for the city. So that's my recommendation to do it as a limited term for two years. So it's, there's an expectation that there's an expiration date for this position. It would be a contract position, which means that it would, um, uh, in this case, if it's, it, if it's an employee, it would unfortunately still be subject to CalPERS, but at least it would be a limited term. And then I'm also recommending setting aside an additional $30,000 for project management for special projects, um, which are also uh, in this general area are managed by myself right now, and financing for complex projects if needed, just setting in a, a budget for $30,000 as we move into some of the larger projects, especially the wastewater treatment plant um, that would then be partially funded from wastewater treatment plant um, uh, funding. And then city manager also recommends, or yeah, I recommend uh, potentially bringing back uh, a part-time office assistant type of help at $35,000. So those are my recommendations, and I would look for your direction on that. Uh, I also recommend establishing fund reserves, which is something that we uh, have briefly touched upon. So right now the policy is to have uh, reserves for the general fund already of 50% of operating expenses. We have been doing that, that's set aside, but we, what we have not been doing is uh, a set aside for capital improvement program. A lot of cities uh, use capital improvement program fund to kind of separate those activities. We have it all kind of blended in the general fund. Uh, but my recommendation for right now is to set an additional 50% uh, of expenditures for the CAP that are planned over the next five years as a reserve that cannot be touched for other purposes. And then uh, I also recommend that for water and wastewater funds that we set aside at least a minimum, that's like a minimum industry recommended uh, operating expenditures equal to three months. That's just, I mean, if you have a real uh, emergency, you will need that for those funds as well. Um, and three months would really be the minimum. So I'm, I'm starting with the minimum there and we'll keep working on additional analysis. And then I also recommend that um, we put an additional into reserve specifically designated for infra infrastructure replacement in both water and wastewater funds as well. Uh, so some of the questions that we might want to address before. And just to clarify on the, for setting aside 50% um, CIP type stuff, would we, um, so, I, I mean, I like the idea and it brings more um, 
clarity and, and a hopefully public understanding of the situation we're in, which is that you know much needed capital projects for the city are right. you know cost far exceed far more than what our ability to pay for them at this time. Um, so if we start setting aside, that's that's a great financial planning tool, and it really sets it aside that that account is for that. But would that be a, like a, a separate fund account underneath the general fund, or just the way that you're presenting it? Like right now, I just because my plan originally was to separate it and make it a capital improvement fund, but because of the COVID-19, it will be just as fine to just have a reserve in the general fund that says CIP reserves, and it will be specifically for that purpose. Okay. I, uh, I understand that, but I, I personally would really like to see it separate, because I think it really starts that process, even if obviously yeah. during what we're experiencing now, we can't put much, much into it. Right. Um, we can put something into it and, right. and start right. the practice. Right, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think th this idea of you know 50% is kind of a, an initial step towards that without much analysis done on it. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, if we do the 10 year CIP, we know we could, you know, start planning for the whole 10 year. That would be a little bit more aggressive. Yeah. Uh, but at least for five years, just ensuring that if we set aside 50% at all times, we will be much more likely in a position to fund those projects. So, so I'd really like to see what that is on the five year and know what that number is and then let it, and then have us start a separate account and put something into it knowing that it's obviously far less than what we have but that's something that we'll have as a goal every year to work towards um, funding so we can hopefully right. catch up here right. perhaps you can use a ramp up approach because obviously given the COVID issue and our budget right. being impaired the way it is maybe we start with 10 or 20 percent this year but we start doing this and we make this commitment Unfortunately, there are too many in the community who made the observation, unfortunately wrongly that, or incorrectly, that, oh, we have plenty of cash. Look at the unassigned reserves and the bank account. They didn't understand that that money really should be used for things like capital improvements or needs to be used for that. Right, exactly. You yeah. can have cash in the bank, but if you have, you know, liabilities of all these projects, it doesn't, you know, doesn't right. really mean anything. Right. Really yeah, I mean, I mean, this city definitely does it a little differently. I haven't seen others do it that way there's usually a capital improvement program fund yeah. which makes it a lot more we clean. are special and i think we I, i'm on the optimistic <laughs> side you know i look at as we get as we weather this you know storm that we have today i mean yeah it hurts but um prior to covid and during covid we have cut a lot of cost out of the operating budget and i think that as things recover and we get back to normal then we're gonna have a huge opportunity there to take some of that revenue at that point in time and start funding that capital improvement plan. For it's the, the same time. thing the businesses did during the recession when they downsized and things started to pick up, they realized that because they were more efficient, they could do it at a, at, at a, at, with at yeah. less cost. Yeah. And that's probably where we'll be. Sadly, that's probably where we'll be. I think we need to start that savings account today. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you. And with that, um, you can either discuss this particular part of the presentation or you can go through uh, the capital improvement program details first and then come back to this i think i would like to hear from you whether you know these focus categories that i had in the beginning of the presentation are actually representative of what you would like to see and if not you know give us alternative direction to include or exclude anything else for the final presented budget or financial plan for june 22nd so unless there's any other questions or comments, I, I mean, I think you're I just doing have, a, a I just great. Have one last one, and That's that because you flashed by it, it had to do with the legal fees, and it was brought up, I guess, by somebody else today. I wanted to make the distinction or comparison between what the previous legal fees were and what we're char what we're doing now, and why. I know that chip has gone beyond the the, the normal um, lines, if you will. I don't know how to put this in, in the right vernacular. But he's done so much more than what has been expected of, of past uh, attorneys. He had to do it. We had no choice in many cases. So I just wanted to make sure people understood, yes, we are allocating more for legal fees, but there's a reason for that. And then people can see for themselves what that is. Okay. Otherwise, I think you're, you're well in line. I, mean, it's just we've, I th think we already gave you the mandate, which is essential, essential, essential. And we'll just keep working towards that. And... Otherwise, you've heard the other feedback that we're looking for um, here. So if we can just reflect that in the next um, the next hearing, that'd be great. Right. I just have the, just the quick comment out of, out of the whole presentation part of it that you just gave. Um, what I was waiting for, what I had read in the packet, and what I wanted to point out, and it has been a public concern, um, is 
exactly what I'll read off of your staff recommendation. And to me, that's, that's one of the single most important parts of this is staff recommends maintaining 50% reserve policy for general funds to cover operating needs in light of economic downturns and emergency needs. Staff also recommends establishment of a reserve for capital improvement program in the amount of 50% of planned capital improvement expenditures over the next five years. And what was really important to me is finally staff recommends establishment of emergency operating reserves for water and wastewater enterprise fund equivalent to a minimum of three months um, of operations and reserve for capital improvement program in the amount of 750,000 for each fund for annual replacement funding because having been on the water district board for ID1 that was pretty much mandatory and um, I know that we are doing other water negotiations right now but um, I have been asked by the public how are we on our capital improvement plan and it, it always goes back to the water and wastewater treatment. So I, I think that that's really key right there. If we do nothing, we have to have those reserves and, and I really would like to see them separated off also. Okay. So sure. thank you. So, and I think three months is too small for. Yes, it yeah, is. I agree. But, but you got to start with the. <laughs> And see where we, yeah, but but again, that's going. why we've been cutting normal operating costs because you know we, we have we're very limited in additional revenue we can bring in. You know we've now struck have this event that's hit us that's now taken everything that we've now worked towards to clear up revenue for the next year. It's now sucked that away from us. You know that's cut and, and even forced us to make further cuts. But you know into the future, hopefully that changes the structure of our organization. We're able to start catching up and paying for that infrastructure. I think if we start presenting that it that way to the community, um, so they understand really the true liability that we're trying to deal with here, then, you know, the same could be done for the wastewater uh, fund where we can take, you know, the whatever it is, the projected 16 million, et cetera, and basically set that as, you know, that's what we need in that um, CIP um, fund there. Uh, and then we can start setting things aside and, and showing, you know, really truly the challenges that we have uh, here to, to deal with and that's something that we've inherited and we have to work through and we have to find uh, solutions and that they're they're not easy so sure. by the way before we wrap this up I want to say thank you to you and your team for putting together what I thought was one of the best uh, organized and presented budgets that I've seen in the last three years um, thank you. it's just easy to read easy to follow there's some questions that uh, you were easy, able to easily address and so appreciate that thank you yeah, I would agree. I think we spend a lot of time talking about, at least I did, about the presentation of looking at all these figures, and it's so much easier to understand what was just put up there than, than before, and so I appreciate the than, effort. Than all that, this? The effort that uh, you <laughs> and your staff, especially Jason, has put into to making all this happen, so I appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Is there any talk of those over the positions that uh, Zeno is recommending? That management? Uh, Management analyst. Analyst. And hey, just make everything transparent, everything out front, let the public know what we're doing and what the benefit is to the city. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, well said. So that with that, we'll move on to, to Matt's uh, portion with the CIPs. Because it's 31 stuff. degrees in here right <laughs> now. <laughs> you, you need more body fat. <laughs> it's like looking at a picture of a beach in the sun, and it can be 20 degrees out, but it's, it's bright. Alrighty, just by way of uh, introduction, I will um, mention that uh, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna basically be covering uh, are three main things. First, I'll be talking about uh, what is the capital improvement program and why it's important. The second thing is I'll just very briefly mention uh, some projects that we've completed over the last 12 to 15 months. And then the third thing I'll be covering is the proposed uh, projects for the next two fiscal years. So I will mention uh, the presentation that you saw approximately a month ago, um, the, the, the draft 
uh, proposed capital improvement program for next fiscal year was at 8.2 million and based on city council direction we've slashed that and cut that back by about 55 percent down to 3.8 million so from 8.2 down to 3.8 uh, there was one other thing I was going to mention on that but uh, anyway but I'm sure I'll remember as it's I continue less. On. <laughs> yeah, yeah so Okay, so our 10-year capital program, or CIP is, as, as it's abbreviated, is a long-range plan that identifies, prioritizes, and schedules projects based on identified needs to maintain the city's public infrastructure. The goal of the city's CIP effort is to provide decision makers, the city council, the opportunity to guide capital investments, make the best use of limited resources, and provide community facilities that function well and contribute to the attractiveness and public health and safety of the city. So some of the reasons for having a capital plan is it allows us to evaluate facilities or, or gives us, or we take the opportunity to, uh, to evaluate facilities and identify needs, to engage and inform the community, to implement long-range strategic planning, and to systematically evaluate all potential projects at the same time. Also uh, gives us an opportunity to balance new investments versus maintaining the existing facilities that we have. It also provides the opportunity for the City Council to set uh, any new uh, or, or refocus on priorities and ensure infrastructure is maintained and it's a reference when adopting the annual city budget. So there's various components of the capital improvement, pro capital improvement program, as you're aware, uh, based on the various different departments and functions of the city. We have a number of different funding sources, Measure A, the General Fund, the Water and Wastewater Fund, the Transit Fund, which is um, predominantly uh, state and federal, federally funded. And we have a variety of different types of projects. We have a few different um, types of projects that we refer to as programs. And that means that it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing uh, need that needs to be addressed every year or every few years. Sometimes it's every other year or every three or four years. But it's, but it's something like our water line replacement program where we, we continually have to be working on that. We also have our pavement maintenance, slurry seal and repairs sidewalk, uh, curb and gutter, drainage improvements, and traffic mitigation projects. Um, of course, water line and valve and fire hydrant replacement, wells and reservoirs, uh, sewer line and manhole replacement, and wastewater re uh, treatment plant repairs and upgrades. And I just highlighted at the bottom there, uh, it's important to remember that when we look at a 10-year capital plan, the first few years are more focused and more precise as you get further out in the plan, uh, those later years are um, preliminary, and we expect those to change as different dynamics happen and um, priorities uh, change over the years. So a few recently completed projects. It was our slurry sill project that included uh, various locations throughout the city last year. Also, we completed the design of the Veterans Hall ADA and restroom upgrade project so we've completed the design for that we have the plans and specifications uh, ready to go uh, at if, if so desired by the City Council um, that project was put on hold after the plans and specs were completed last year uh, because of um, uh, consideration of other options and, and, and uh, uses for the vets hall so then um, we also completed the wastewater treatment plant uh, land acquisition for the um, proposed plant upgrade project. We also completed the design of the Fifth Street sidewalk project. That project's out to bid, and on Tuesday uh, next week is the bid <coughs> opening. And so we'll be bringing that uh, to you uh, hopefully on uh, June 22nd for award of that contract, and that's a partially grant-funded project. Also, the Fjord Sewer Lift Station Odor Control Upgrades project that was completed the Mission Drive sewer main crossing repair project was completed. That's the section of sewer line that goes under Mission Drive from, um, from the, the bottom end or the lower end of Hans Christian Anderson Park under the highway there over uh, to the area uh, between 
Nielsen's Lumber Yard and the Mobile Home Park where the sewer line uh, extends through there. So that was a really successful project, came in under budget. And we did the wastewater treatment plant pond dredging project. So as we were working on denitrifying, uh, tweaking our treatment process to denitrify the wastewater, um, that ended up with a lot of um, sludge into the one of our ponds. And so we dredged that and um, completed that project. And then we did a San Jose Valley Transit bus stop lighting retrofit project. And also one of the main studies that we completed was the, um, the city's uh, first ever storm drain master plan. So that that's, uh, completes the recently completed projects. So for next fiscal year, we have these five projects that are um, what we consider high priority, uh, high, high recommended projects. Uh, one again is the Fifth Street Sidewalk Project. Uh, about approximately 40% of the cost of that is grant funded. The second project is the Solvang School Sidewalk Project. We were just informed recently, uh, I think it was la uh, I guess in May, yeah, early May, that uh, we, were, we were the top scoring uh, application for um, the uh, SBCAG, the Measure A Bike Ped and Safe Routes to School program. And so, uh, pr again, about a third of the project cost for that is um, grant funded. And then our wastewater treatment plant aeration system upgrades. So just to clarify on that, uh, we're moving forward with the design of all the wastewater treatment plant upgrades and per city council direction, the top priority work was to first implement the, um, the uh, aeration system upgrades. So our consultant prepared a technical memo. Basically, it's like a pr preliminary design report reviewing all their recommendations. We've now approved that, and they're working on the plans and specs. Uh, so we can put that out to bid. And the, um, the engineer's uh, cost estimate, I believe, is $2.4 million, but there's about $100,000 uh, in included or uh, proposed in the budget for um, assistance with construction inspection, because some of the work will be electrical and mechanical work that uh, will require some special inspection. Uh, so I'm hoping within the next two months to have those plans uh, go out to bid. So, so again, our consultant's working on the plans and specs for uh, first on that aeration system upgrade. Uh, then the other two projects are also state and federally funded, which is the San Jose Valley Transit uh, Vehicle Replacement Program. So uh, every year we replace one or two um, buses. And then the last project, uh, we did receive a grant also to um, upgrade the bus stop there on Mission Drive in front of the Union Bank. Uh, right now there's just a patch of grass and a little sign there, but the, the bus stop's proposed to be moved to, uh, to um, the east side of that driveway along Mission Drive and uh, a small retaining wall constructed to make a level area for a, um, a proper bus stop and a shelter. In addition, for next fiscal year, we propose several studies. Now, I will mention that um, a month ago when we presented this, um, I, one of the council members, I forget, I have had it, I, I took notes, but I didn't note who commented, but one of the comments was, well, maybe we should just cancel all studies and everything. And um, uh, we did review the list of studies, and there were several that we um, are recommending that get pushed back uh, in the schedule, um, either to the second year of the budget or beyond that. But um, we feel that there are several studies that it would be really prudent and beneficial for the, the city to proceed with. Uh, so the first one is the sewer rate study. Zena touched on that um, briefly uh, uh, as far as the wastewater fund uh, budget and the need to look at the um, sewer rates. Also, there's uh, four different uh, there's four different general fund studies. I'm, I'm sorry, there's the general fund fee study. Zena also mentioned that, um, which is uh, important for to allow the city to... Uh, that's a good study. Yeah, that that's, uh, allows us to get proper cost recovery for our various services. And then there's four general plan um, elements that we're recommending are up to be updated. Uh, we have a grant to cover the cost for two of those, the um, 
against the land use element, the circulation and parking element, the housing element, and the design element. Then uh, we awarded, the city council awarded a contract to a firm to do the parking study, but that was just before the COVID-19 uh, all hit and the um, uh, uh, tourism dropped off. So we basically uh, talked to the consultant and they've agreed. We put that project on hold because part of the work that we're going to do is come out and, and um, do some like counts uh, in the parking lots and stuff and look at the turnover rate and different things like that. So it didn't make sense to proceed with that when the data would be like um, uh, not, you know, inaccurate or not representative. So, so they will be starting that back again, uh, their work uh, in July, the end of July. Uh, also, the next uh, study is the local roads, road safety plan. Uh, we will not do that unless we get the grant to fund it. And so we're, um, we're paying $3,000. A consultant is helping us um, apply for those funds this fiscal year. And we should find out, uh, you know, in late summer or early fall if we receive a grant. And um, the grant would cover about... Um, 90% of the cost to do that uh, local road safety plan. And as mentioned there, that plan is required if the city ever wants to apply in the future for any highway safety improvement program uh, grant funding. So right now we don't, th that, that HSIP, that Highway Safety Improvement Program uh, grant program, generally you have to have some, some fatalities in order to get um, grant funding for that program. But um, which which we don't have right now, which it's good. Mm -hmm. But but there may be some time in the future where the city does want to pursue that, and so this puts us in the position where we 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 have met all the eligibility requirements and and can pursue that in the future if necessary uh, by ha by completing that local road safety plan. The next thing is the water master plan update. You'll see in the budget. Um, it's the, the cost proposed is fairly modest. Um, what we're proposing is for uh, our in-house staff to do most of the work. We have a consultant that um, has our, uh, the, the computer model of our water system. The, we would need to rely on the consultant to do some modeling runs and analysis of different demand scenarios uh, and future uh, growth projections. But um, the last uh, time the the last two or three times the water master plan was updated, it was done by the in-house staff. I, I actually did the, the last update. Um, but um, anyway, so, so in order to save money, we're proposing to do a lot of that work in-house. And then the next item is the water system risk and resiliency study. This is a mandated study. It's a little bit unusual. Um, normally we get mandates from um, the State Water Resources Control Board or some other state agency. This is coming directly from the federal EPA. And uh, anyway, so the, the goal or the need for this um, is to help agencies uh, evaluate their system, identify where there's potential risk, and then take um, measures to uh, reduce the risk in, uh, in failure uh, of the system. So it's to ensure reliable operation of, of our water system during a variety of different um, uh, emergencies and scenarios. So, and then the, the last one I think there is the sewer system master plan update. And again, with that, the, the city's, um, the last sewer system master plan update was from 1988. So we're really way overdue. Um, we've had this kind of in the 10-year plan for several years, but just had other priorities, so that 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 uh, uh, prevented us from moving forward. So, so we recommend uh, proceeding with that also. And then, so then this next group is for the second year in our budget, fiscal year 21-22, and we have a variety of um, projects and studies: uh, parking lot five minor improvements, Second Street drainage improvements. A part of that Second Street drainage improvement project is the trash capture improvements. But to track the funding of that and um, uh, to comply with our stormwater permit requirements, we, we have those 
we separated those two items in the budget so we can more easily track it and document our expenditures on that. Then we have the South Alisal Pavement Reconstruction Project and the South Alisal Culvert Upsizing. Those are the culvert upsizing will actually be part of the pavement reconstruction project, but again, we want to attract those um, costs separately. Then uh, manhole, uh, our manhole rehabilitation program, and then um, proceeding with the wastewater treatment plant, uh, the water quality project. So what we're proposing is uh, our consultant is finishing a couple technical memos uh, for the wastewater treatment plant. And they're uh, preparing and finishing up the plans and specs for the immediate aeration system upgrade. But to help us better manage our cash flow for the wastewater fund, <coughs> once we once we go out to bid on the immediate aeration system upgrades, that's a two point four million dollar project, right? So once we go out to bid on that, we're going to tell our engineering consultant, take a pause, stop, wait, and then once we finish the construction of the uh, aeration system upgrades, then we'll have our consultant, we'll give them the green light again and they can start that. But we didn't want to burn through the money for the aeration system upgrade and, and also have the consultant working on the, the design work, um, burning through those funds as well. So th this is basically an adjustment that we're proposing or recommending based on the, you know, these new circumstances of COVID-19. So we can adjust that or, or, or proceed however the city council prefers, but that, that's our recommendation at this point, and that's what's reflected in the budget. Um, anyway, so then, uh, so instead of those two things happening in parallel, they'd be happening in sequence, one after the other. So that's, just wanted to mention that. Um, <coughs> And then we've um, identified a list of uh, priority three projects and studies. These are these are other projects that um, w had been in the two this two year budget, but based on the council's direction and this, our COVID nineteen situation, we pushed these projects out to to occur after the next two years. So that's just the list of those those projects. And w one one of the items you'll see is the water aid study. As Zena mentioned, you know our reserve had been built up pretty solid for that, so w there's not an immediate need to to look at that. Uh, the other thing that um, we wanted to uh, highlight are some of the um, more critical strategic planning um, projects in the capital plan, and these are projects that are, again are after the next two years but are in the plan that we um, kind of want to keep in the back of our mind because these are kind of the more big, the larger, more, more critical projects. Um, so there's, first of all, there's additional sections uh, of the general plan that need to be updated. And then, as I mentioned, there's the Veterans Hall, ADA, and bathroom upgrades, whether or not we want to proceed with that or not. Um, the engineer's estimate, uh, final engineer's estimate for that, well, I believe, was about 440,000. Um, I w will mention that the, um, uh, in addition to the ADA upgrades and the bathroom upgrades, it does include replacement of um, all the windows and doors on the Legion Wing bu building. Um, as you're probably aware, those windows and doors are, are kind of outdated and, 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 and some of them don't function properly. Um, then the next project is the Alisal Bridge Pier Repair Project. So because of the Bradbury Dam, because of uh, preventing silt and gravel from moving downstream from the mountains, and because of the gravel mining operations downstream, that's caused scour in the, in the San Inez River um, at all the bridges along the river um, over the last, you know, 30 years, 40 years. But um, so we have a few piers, which are the columns that support the, the, the bridge, um, that there's been a, uh, excessive scour and damage to the pile cap or the, f the foundation at the base of the column. And so that, that's a really critical project to um, uh, begin in the next few years. And also we're doing some trash capture uh, work with the St Second Street Storm Drain project here in the in the dirt lot across the street. However, um, <coughs> based on our NPDES permit, 
we're required to implement uh, a few different trash capture projects over the next 10 years. And then also the Caltrans Highway 246 bridge replacement and widening project. So Caltrans has now in their shop, which is kind of like their maintenance program, they have a project identified and we actually just had the initial kickoff uh, meeting with their planning group on some of the environmental scoping for that project. They're going to be, this is the, the Highway 246 bridge over Alamo Pintado Creek. They're going to be removing that bridge, replacing it, and widening it. However, um, we've been talking to them and really trying to push them to include the connectivity for the, um, the existing class one bike path so that uh, they'll include in the design of that project um, how that bike path connects you know to the intersection of um, Mission and Alamo Pintado Road so there may be some costs that um, Caltrans comes back and tells us hey that's you know we're happy to do that but that's not covered under our maintenance program so the city's gonna have to pay for that so we don't know the details of that yet. It'll be a few years before um, they get into the full design. But, um, but we, the staff feels it's important for the city to plan and, and have a, you know, a few million dollars set aside uh, so that we can um, implement, if there's some important um, desires of the city council as far as the bike path and the connectivity and everything, we have some money to contribute to make sure those things happen. And then there's the Mission Drive Easton bike path and shoulder widening project. That's <coughs> sort of connected to this bridge widening that Caltrans is doing. Um, we're all, staff is also trying to push them to, when they do the widening of and replacement of the bridge, to look at the intersection of Alamo Pontado and Mission Drive. But um, we can only just encourage and kind of suggest that they um, look at that and incorporate that in there. Uh, and so we, we're, we're going to continue to push them to do that. But um, so this, this project, this Mission Drive Easton Bikeway, kind of ties into that because that's from Pine Street down to Alamo Pintado Road. And so we want to be able to uh, possibly implement a, um, a joint project or two projects in sequence. Uh, where we're addressing that whole stretch. You know, we don't want Caltrans to just do kind of a piecemeal thing um, at the bridge and then the intersection and, and the rest of Mission Drive up to Pine Street is not really addressed. So uh, the exact details of how this all might end up um, will um, become more clear in the next few years as Caltrans begins in, into the engineering of the bridge replacement. So we'll be tracking that closely, and, and, that, and, and our, our city project may um, morph a little bit depending on what, you know, what Caltrans is willing or not willing to include in their project. So, uh, and just the last few strategic planning projects is the Fjord Drive extension is still in our capital plan. It's, it's been in there for many years. I think there's one or, one or two years where it got dropped because um, it was pushed out beyond the 10 years. But, um, but that's still in there. Uh, that's, that was mentioned in our, um, the circulation element of the city's uh, general plan. And then our waterline replacement program. So after we do this uh, water master plan update, we'll be able to look at um, future demands and um, uh, model that in our water system and then come up with the whole program of where do we have uh, water lines that are undersized and where do we have the, mo the most old or deteriorated water lines that have the, the greatest leak history or uh, history of problems that need to be replaced. Um, and then another important project is a Reservoir 1 expansion project. So that's been in our 10-year um, capital plan for several years. Uh, basically, <coughs> our, our primary zone, which covers about 70% of our system, uh, is Zone 1. And we do not have sufficient reservoir storage in that zone. So what happens is when we have these peak demands in the summer, instead of our re reservoirs just um, making up that difference, 
uh, when during you know uh, the morning and evening where the when the demands are peaking, um, we have to kick on and turn on more wells. So um, that's been the city's historical way of um, meeting peak demand, which is not really um, recommended. Uh, uh, one thing you're using power during the peak time of the peak times um, to meet those demands, and also um, if you have a power failure. Uh, so if you have, you know, the public safety power shut off or um, a wildfire or an earthquake that, you know, you lose power, you then have to run around and get all your emergency generators positioned and running and, and it um, makes your system less reliable. So that's, that's an important project. Um, I think with the last master plan update, uh, uh, it was, and it, 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 we're referring to it, referring to it as an expansion project because our existing reservoir at the top of Alistair Road would, is the reservoir that we're recommending would be expanded or enlarged. So, uh, there's also our sewer line replacement program, and then also um, uh, eventually we'll need to do some uh, more significant upgrades to the fjord lift station. So this this is the summary. Um, I think the staff report included kind of the more detailed um, section by section breakouts, and um, and and that concludes my uh, presentation. So at this point, we would just like uh, council direction: should we um, delete any projects, push any projects back, reduce the budgets on any projects, uh, add anything, or defer anything? So. We're happy to take any questions and get your direction. Um, I know we've uh, performed like some significant um, or emergency repair type work to the fjord lift station, but I'd like to know more about the more major upgrades you're um, talking about there. Sure, sure. Uh, so basically, the electrical and mechanical equipment have um, generally a lot of those things, especially like the electrical, it usually has about a 20 year um, life. Uh, it can go longer than that, but um, uh, uh, so so that project would be to upgrade some of the electrical systems, and then also look at the pumps. We do replace the pumps um, more frequently than 20 years. Um, the pumps we have in there now are really really good quality pumps, and they usually last about 10 years. But um, but we'd look at the piping, um, the access hatch, the um, and all the electrical and mechanical and the SCADA controls and everything and, and upgrade that, yeah. So okay. And, and what kind of cost roughly are we talking about there? Um, look real quick. Yeah, that's about $800,000 project. Okay. And then the, um, uh, I haven't gotten any further complaints for quite some. I used to get a lot of complaints about um, the, odors. Sm the odor down there. Yeah, we did some upgrades to uh, what was it called again? The um, the scrubber. Right, right. 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 So is that are, are we not receiving as many complaints anymore? Does it seem to be pretty uh, effective? Yeah, I don't believe it was, we've received a single complaint since it's been completed. Okay. So Perfect. it's a much it was a much um, superior system mm -hmm. that we installed than what we had. So. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Great. <coughs> so I've got a question. Karen? Uh, um, I'm impressed that we managed to get the um, solving school sidewalk project going because I know that we were never able to get ourselves number one on the list to be considered for stuff. So how did that happen? Well, that's a really good question. So previously, we knew, we always felt all along that that project was a um, really good, uh, strong candidate for grant funding. Mm -hmm. And we applied twice for ATP grants through Caltrans. So that's the active transportation program. Uh, we have uh, twice applied for grant funding and we scored okay, but not an well enough to make the, the cut. And what we were told is that um, and I, and I asked, like, how could we not get funding? This is project, the sidewalk's right across the street from the school, for crying out loud. Uh, you know, how could we not get funded? Um, but they said that the project was not transformational enough. They wanted transformational, they're looking for transformational projects, bigger 
bigger projects, multi-million dollar projects that are more transformational. And so um, that is why we didn't get funding through Caltrans and, and the California Transportation Commission through that active transportation program. So you built a but bridge. Built a bridge from one point to the school <laughs> that took it over all the traffic, they would have gone, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I know. So can we do the, the Tesla tunnel underneath uh, 246? <laughs> Hey, the the, app, the grant application is would be a fraction of the project cost. So, um, <laughs> if you want us to do that, I think I we mean, should apply for that. That'd make the residents happy. Yeah, the bigger the better. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah, it's and then yeah. change your mind. <laughs> but um, so then uh, we took so we had this very detailed, lengthy, um, thorough grant ATP grant application, and then we just repackaged that for our Santa Barbara County. Um, measure A, uh, SBCAG, Safe Routes okay. School mm -hmm. grant program, and we just like hit a hit a grand slam because we had spent all that time and had all this detailed information and letters of community support and all this stuff, and we updated all that, and uh, we just went you know guns blazing and and uh, just scored really well um, in the local grant program, so. Well, yeah, congrats. That was, that's a really nice job. Yeah, I'm just wondering why or if there was any way that that could possibly have been tied into um, our need for um, participation in the uh, Caltrans Highway 246 bridge replacement and the East Drive and, uh, you know, bikeway shoulder widening project. And I know you were saying that a lot of times when we have to do um, Caltrans projects, um, they require uh, fatality statistics. And I, you know, the Caltrans Highway 246 bridge replacement widening project, that area is, that is just a recipe for disaster with the, you know, increasing population here and more people on bicycles, especially children. I mean, you, that's, that is a recipe for disaster. And if, if you're going to see fatalities, it's going to be at that intersection. And we've already had people hit at that intersection. Right, right. So. Yeah, that's correct. I don't know how we could ever tie that into something to, to, to get that done so we wouldn't have to have as much financial participation. Yeah. Well, one of the things, uh, let me see if it's, if it's on here. Yeah, okay, well. Um, yeah, so one of the strategies would be to um, do a study uh, where we have some community workshops and things like that and get a lot of community input uh, on the widening of Mission Drive at both ends of town. So basically from like Skip on the, on the west end from Skip Mesa Road up to like Nycobing or maybe Fifth Street and then on the east end from Pine Street down to Alamo Pintado. So basically the idea is do all the things to put us in a really strong position to apply for an active transportation grant because then that grant that under that grant program I mean you ha you'll have to wait a while but mm -hmm. to get to do implement the project but that grant program covers like 90 95 percent of the cost right so you can do like a 10 million dollar project and and you're only spending a million dollars you know type of thing you know so so that had been part of our strategy and it kind of this whole COVID-19 sort of threw a wrench into that, um, but that is a, um, a study that we recommend down the road uh, to to do that. Look, get, you know, um, look at different alternatives how we could widen it and configure the road and the bike lanes and things like that. And then, um, with all that community support and documentation and everything, then that's that gives us really. Um, strong credentials to then apply for an ATP grant uh, in a future in a future cycle um, so great thanks Matt thanks Matt are there any other questions or comments no okay what that else was do we a got? lot of work that was a lot of work Matt this I believe this presents our presentation Oh yeah. Oh, Zena did a ton of work too. So I mean, and I mean, yeah. I my hats off to you. Zena's done it. This is amazing. I it, you really did a great job. Thank you. Uh, I, I love it when yes, staff too. gets you together too. and Zena. knocks it out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Come by, uh, uh, community support the last few weeks seems like it's an oxymoron. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming on a Saturday and taking the extra time. And you know, I don't, normally we'd only have two hearings on the budget, so here we're at least going to have three, and we've had this additional workshop to provide you know additional public engagement. And that's really what this meeting was about, um, just to afford that that extra opportunity there, and then and then obviously dedicate time towards just budget. Um, so. I think we can probably end today's um, meeting we've received. We'll, um, you have some direction here. We'll go through this one last time and, and have a final, hopefully, a final budget adoption. Okay, that was my question. So the city council will um, approve and adopt the capital yes. plan so with the budget next Yes, so on June 22nd, we'll have the actual formal adoption of the budget that will include both operating budget and uh, CAP, as well as the GAN limit, all at the same time. But yeah, I got to say how impressed I am, because in the pre years previous, they would try to do these things separately, right, and, and months apart, so it was hard to follow and, and keep track of what they did. And, with respect to the budget and CIPs. To be able to do this together, that's the way it's supposed to be, and you guys did it cleanly and smoothly. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And then uh, my last thing is uh, I, I, he, I hear different things about some progressions we've had regarding the wastewater treatment plant um, upgrade and stuff. It might just be appropriate, um, especially since we're getting uh, questions from the public about what's going on with that. Um, maybe at the, obviously not this coming Monday, um, but maybe the following regular meeting we do a wastewater treatment plant update uh there sure sure that'd okay. be fine thank you are you good? mr mayor may i mm -hmm. make a quick comment yes and then um, i want to go next after you well, one of the very first things that the city asked me actually the former city manager asked me to look at and which was a big issue june of last year was the fact that you guys were not anywhere near ready to adopt your budget before july the first and you had a you had a whole bunch of just like race around at the end of june things that you had to do and and that was the beginning of the whole set of issues with the scvb because that budget had not been prepared and ready to go so i want to to again reaffirm the the love fest that has gone on for your current staff in the middle of COVID-19 and everything else, you are so far in advance of where you were a year ago. Cool. It's been a lot of work, but thank you. Can I have two for my comments? Yes. Um, I personally would like to apologize to Jeremy and to Scott from IDK for the abuse that they're taking from some of the people in town or over just trying to do their jobs at the direction of council, and I wish that would be directed at council because it's not fair for Jeremy to get accosted on Copenhagen Street when he's putting up structures, et cetera, and it makes me really sad that, that's, that we've gotten to this point in discourse. And lastly is people forget with all that's going on right now, it was 76 years ago today, you guys, that there were thousands and thousands of American and Canadian and English soldiers dead on the beaches of Normandy. And I just think that I want to make a comment about that, and God bless them. And God bless America, and thanks for what they've done. And, and I'm just so indebted for the people that fought for the right for us to behave like idiots or, or to protest and, and do things properly and, and to share our opinions with each other nationally right now. And a lot of people have sacrificed to give us this opportunity, and I'm forever indebted to them. Thanks. That's all i got to say. Thank you, Robert. Anyone else? Thank you. Actually, I do have one, since you brought this up, Robert. Uh, number one, I appreciate that comment tremendously. It was great. And uh, well worth remembering the gentlemen, the men who served in the sacrifice that way. And women. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm thinking, forget it. But also, I, I, I'm going to end with the, the immortal words, words of Ed Skid. I think he said something to us that, you know, one third of the people are probably going to hate you. One third are probably going to love you. And there's a third in the middle that you're going to fight for. And I think that's what we're seeing now, unfortunately. There's a third of the population that just wants what they want, and they don't want to talk about anything else or in any other way. And I saw the same thing. Unfortunately, poor Scott Schumach was uh, verbally accosted and abused by the same people. And they went after me as well in a very vicious and nasty way. They, they have no intention of, of having a civil discourse. Or be constructive, I know. Or I think it's less than 30 percent, but it's a very vocal crowd. Right. Thank you. With that, we're adjourned.